Now, our last panel before the break uh, described lawyers as unsung heroes. <clears throat> so while we're printing the t-shirts, hats, and other merchandise with that slogan, uh, we are fortunate to have a panel full of experienced, terrific attorneys to help us navigate the topic of harmonizing the regulatory efforts in cyber. There is a lot going on in this regulatory landscape, including the SEC's cyber disclosure rule, attempts to regulate critical infrastructure, a new executive order on AI, and a new executive order on the prevention of uh, preventing access to Americans' bulk sensitive personal data. To that end, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our moderator, Mr. Alan Rawl. Mr. Rawl is a senior counsel at Sidley Austin and the founder of Sidley Austin's privacy and cybersecurity practice. Alan also served in government as the vice chairman of the White House and now the independent Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. He was the general counsel of the Office of Management and Budget, the general counsel of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and associate counsel to the president. Alan, over to you. Thanks very much for the introduction and for the opportunity to, uh, to be with you all uh, today. It sounds like you've had a great conference so far, and I want one of those unsung hero t-shirts for sure, so uh, if that uh, comes to pass. So um, I'm going to be the moderator and also the kind of voice or perspective from the, the private sector, so I understand that means that I'm kind of moderator plus or minus, uh, depending on how you think it uh, goes. So um, my first uh, privilege is going to be to introduce our esteemed government uh, panelists. Then I'll make some introductory uh, comments that will be, uh, you can take them as the uh, perspective, uh, perhaps from corporate America, uh, since uh, those are the clients that I, I typically represent. Uh, and they often uh, ask the same questions that all of you are. What about these conflicting, duplicative, redundant, time-consuming, and burdensome requirements and, and uh, reporting obligations? But first, uh, introduction. So Spencer Fisher, to my immediate right is the Chief Counsel for the Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity, and Infrastructure Security Agency, affectionately known as CISA. We'll come back to acronyms later. All of you have lots of experience with acronyms, but we have a challenging one we're going to discuss later. Prior to joining CISA, Mr. Fisher, Spencer served as Chief Counsel with the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, ODNI. Um, in 2019 to 2020, he was on a joint duty assignment as deputy legal advisor at the National uh, Security Council, where he provided legal counsel on national security and foreign relations issues related to cybersecurity uh, and other issues. Um, I will also would like to note that Spencer served in the United States Marine Corps Reserve for over 22 years and currently uh, Chief Warrant Officer uh, for. Uh, he's going to explain that to me later, but is, he is assigned to the Marine Innovation Unit in New York. Um, Mr. Fisher received his law degree from Georgetown University Law Center. Mike Buckwald from the Department of Justice National Security Division um, is uh, at the end there, and he raised his hand to identify himself. He focuses on cybersecurity and other law and technology policy issues. He represents the department in policy meetings with the White House National Security Council and a variety of other interagency and external meetings, including with uh, the aforementioned private sector. Previously, uh, Mike served as counsel and deputy staff director for the oversight and, and policy uh, issues on the U.S. Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. SISI, I think, is the pronunciation of that acronym. He earned his uh, uh, law degree from the University of Virginia and um, his BA from, from Yale. So um, with that, um, I, I, I'll just give you a little bit of a perspective um, from, the, from the private sector. And we're very excited by an initiative uh, from the White House, the o Office of the National Cyber Directive, ONCD, um, which put out a request for information focused on harmonizing cybersecurity se uh, requirements. Um, and as of now, the request for information is still pending. The deadline was extended till uh, October of last year. No report issued yet. Maybe some news will be broken today, but in any event, uh, no, nothing, uh, nothing public. But the, the RFI, the Request for Information from the ONCD, um, is about harmonizing cybersecurity regulations. And I want to distinguish that 
as from cybersecurity reporting of incidents or events or, or data breaches. So there's reporting and there's requirements. Uh, the, the, the White House ONCD effort initiative is focused on the substantive uh, requirements or regulations that would apply to cybersecurity. But the, um, it, it's worth focusing for the purposes of this panel on the fact that the RFI from the White House uh, talks about harmonizing not only regulations and rules, but also assessments and audits of regulated entities. And the RFI expresses what the benefits and purposes of harmonization are. It's to avoid um, inconsistent, contradictory, duplicative uh, regulations, which lead to a greater focus on compliance than security. So uh, greater harmonization can, at least in theory, and potentially lead to greater security at lower cost rather than distraction with trying to achieve the same cybersecurity objectives with overlapping, redundant, and sometimes uh, rules that require deconfliction. Um, the, um, some of the questions that were posed by the White House to uh, the uh, private sector are to provide examples of these conflicting uh, requirements, of course, information on how entities in the private sector, for example, use third-party cybersecurity frameworks like the NIST, National Institute for Standards and Technology Cybersecurity Framework. I, f I uh, believe we'll probably hear a little bit more about that later. So a couple of quick uh, perspectives. I think we're seeing a shift towards greater regulation, mandatory regulation of cybersecurity as opposed to the, the heretofore a prevailing view that cybersecurity regulation, at least of the private sector, should be more in the nature of voluntary, more cooperative, collaborative. Definitely a shift. Shift towards greater accountability, maybe even liability. I uh, hope we'll hear a little bit more about that later on software vulnerabilities. Uh, and uh, there was a, a, a rather scathing report issued in the last week or so from the Cybersecurity Review Board that's part of the Department of Homeland Sec uh, Security, uh, where CISA is located on software um, vulnerabilities and insecurities uh, that was uh, really addressing uh, Microsoft in, in particular. Also a shift towards cybersecurity events and incidents as opposed to data breaches that uh, focus primarily on personal uh, information. Uh, so a shift towards uh, cybersecurity for IT systems, edge devices like virtual private networks, critical infrastructure, of course, operational technology, and con internet connected devices, uh, internet of things, IOT. So again, looking at it from the, the private sector, what I see as uh, conflicts and, and uh, opportunities for beneficial harmonization for example, comparing the Federal Trade Commission, which is an enforcement agency that sues my clients from the Federal Bureau of Investigation of the Department of Justice, which treats my clients like victims, the victims that they are, the victims of cybersecurity criminals or uh, uh, state-sponsored um, activities. Uh, we see conflicts between the Securities and Exchange Commission, for example, and the Department of Justice or FBI regarding um, the public notification of cybersecurity incidents under a very strict time frame at the same time that maybe CISA, the FBI, international counterparts are working with a company to fix, patch, remediate, or in any event deal with a, an incident in a framework of responsible disclosure as opposed to, uh, let's say, breakneck disclosure to the public because of the SEC's um, imperative to provide information uh, to investors. Uh, we see different conflicts as, as approach to cyber disclosures from the banking agencies, for example, uh, versus the Securities and Exchange Commission again. Also, US, uh, e e Europe, EU, the US, uh, GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, very focused on privacy uh, breaches, as you might imagine. So with that uh, perspective, let me uh, turn to um, Spencer Fisher from CISA. And maybe you could start out just explaining CISA's overall responsibility, who your counterparts are that uh, some of in the audience will be most interested in at the Department of Defense uh, and elsewhere. Okay. Um, well, thank you for that, Alan. I really appreciate it, and I appreciate the introduction. Also, just wanted to say thank you to the folks at Cyber Command for having me here today to uh, speak about CISA and our mission. 
Um, I have tuned into this many times virtually, but have never actually been here in person, so I'm happy to be here. Um, and I, I, I know the, the way it works virtually, so I will try to grab your attention because I know the people that are tuning in virtually are simultaneously multitasking, doing many other things, possibly still eating lunch. You will listen to me. Um, <laughs> So CISA's cybersecurity mission it really falls in two general categories. So one is the protection of the federal civilian executive branch network. Two, assisting non-federal entities, especially those involved in critical infrastructure, protect their networks. Um, so at a very high level, those are our, uh, that is our mission in this space. On the FSEB, so the FSEB, which is the, the acronym for Federal Civilian Executive Branch, if you're not uh, tracking that acronym, I'm happy to add a new one to your toolkit. Um, that derives from uh, FISMA, so Federal Information Security Modernization Act of 2014. Under FISMA, agency heads are responsible for the protection of their own networks, but the Secretary of DHS is responsible for administering the implementation of agency if information security policies and practices. FISMA specifically excludes national security systems. So, Alan, you mentioned um, you know, folks that we work with, so under the DHS Secretary's responsibilities, um, NSS is, is excluded, uh, and those are systems which involve intelligence activities or military capabilities, so kind of like the world uh, I came from before uh, going to CISA. FISMA provides that the DNI, uh, the Director of National Intelligence, and the Secretary of Defense have authority equivalent to CISA for NSS. So that's the basic uh, breakdown uh, between the FSEB and then uh, the subcomponent of the NSS. So FISMA additionally provides CISA with the authority to issue binding operational directives and emergency directives. Folks in the room and, and virtually may have seen those um, that are binding on FSEB agencies. Um, and DOD has a similar process uh, that they've established under a national security memorandum. Um, so how that works. So CISA and DOD, in consultation with OMB, established procedures for DOD and CISA to immediately share with each other um, incident response orders or emergency directives or binding operational directives, EDs and BODs, uh, applying to their respective information networks. So I know we're here to talk about uh, information sharing. We're here to talk about harmonization. So that's one example of how things are harmonized, in fact. So that information automatically is shared. The receiving agency is then required to evaluate whether to adopt any of the guidance contained in that order or directive issued by the other department, consistent with regulations concerning the sharing of classified information. Um, and we've worked, so we, CISA, have worked collaboratively to develop these procedures and regularly engage in this process um, with departments that work to carry out their respective missions to protect the FSEB and Department of Defense networks. So um, I can go in further into detail about the defense industrial base and some of those issues if you'd like, or we can stop there and move to different questions. Sure, and, and again, that we're gonna leave time for questions from the audience, so if you do wanna talk about some of these topics in greater detail or topics that uh, we, we've uh, tried to avoid and therefore you wanna elicit from us through a hostile question from the audience, uh, we'll try to ignore you as well. No, maybe we'll consider responding. Uh, but uh, thanks for that, uh, Spencer. Um, turning to the, the, the substance frameworks that where some of the requirements, uh, be they uh, mandatory or perhaps suggested, but there are various legislative and risk management frameworks for, for cybersecurity. C can you describe, please, Spencer, the, the, the frameworks that you think are worth uh, discussing and what you see as the kind of is the, the, the issues where the opportunity for harmonization might be you know, beneficial and where there are challenges on the substantive side? Yeah, and let me just say at the outset that in today's world of interconnectedness, the importance of harmonizing regulatory cybersecurity efforts can't be overstated. But I do want to keep in mind the, the, the definition of harmony. Um, harmony means to me uh, like an orchestra, right? So you've got, there's folks that play the tuba, there's folks that play the oboe, there's folks that play other musical stuff. I don't know these things. Director Easterly plays the guitar, but I don't, I don't personally have any musical talent. Um, that doesn't mean everyone's playing the same instrument, right? It means that they're playing different instruments that work together, right? So I think that's an important thing to keep in mind because I do feel like some of the discussion about harmonization seems to imply that we, as agencies of the U.S. government, should all be doing the exact same thing, but we all have different authorities and frameworks. 
So I'll speak to you a little bit about um, some of those frameworks. Um, and no doubt that we should both formally and informally coordinate. Um, I've been part of, and I know Alan, you've been part of formal coordination networks uh, that happen at the National Security Council and that happen at the Office of Management and Budget. There's a lot of informal coordination that happens among agencies as well, uh, and that's equally, if not more important sometimes. Um, but an overall comment, and I'll, I'll drill down a little bit on cyber risk management. So at a general level, risk management framework allows organizations to assess the risk to their IT systems and then allows organizations to apply controls, safeguards, and achieve a level of protection that organizations believe is commensurate with the risk level. So there are provisions of FISMA, the NIST, uh, as Alan mentioned at the outset, um, uh, cybersecurity framework, um, CPGs, so CISA's cyber performance goals. Um, but these, and, and going back to my harmony point, these frameworks are designed for different audiences and different risk tolerances. So these should be thought of as a continuum of approaches where FISMA contemplates specific controls and safeguards in response to levels of data and system sensitivity, the CSS, CSF, I'm sorry, emphasizes risk profiles and allows implementation, implementing organizations latitude to apply their, old, their own controls. And the CPGs focus on implementing a set of controls and safeguards that address a baseline level of risk and they're voluntary, right? So all of these things working together, again, going back to the, the harmonization point, we've got different instruments that are playing different tunes, but they are working together in a continuum. Um, I can go into more detail if you'd like about the OMB uh, and FISMA, the NIST cybersecurity framework, CPGs, uh, but I'll leave it there for now. Okay, maybe we can uh, come back to, to the detail as the audience uh, may be interested. Um, but I, I, I really do want to emphasize the point for, uh, for our audience here that while there's a lot of commonality, there's no shortage of the different substantive standards that Spencer was, uh, was, was referring to. There are lots of great requirements out there, but uh, while harmonization would seem to be kind of a no-brainer, the fact is very much as, as you said, that the diff different agencies have different missions, uh, you know, in addition to different sensitivities and risk tolerances, but literally different missions. Uh, and because of that, while there's this, there's this perception that because technology is kind of a general subject and cybersecurity is relevant to all technology, that cybersecurity can be readily harmonized and all of the differences can be uh, you know, suppressed or submerged, but I don't know that we're ever going to get there. But maybe we can try to before the end of the, our panel today. Mike, let me, let me turn over to you. If you would you describe, please, uh, at the Department of Justice, what, what, what are the roles on cyber uh, for the National Security Division and your other counterpart uh, uh, units or, or agencies within the Department of Justice? Yeah, thanks, Alan, and um, thanks for the introduction and the invitation from uh, Cyber Command to come down and speak. I, too, uh, have, have dialed in in years past uh, virtually and was watching yesterday, so uh, thanks to the organizers for planning such a great conference. Um, at the National Security Division, we're focused on what I call the big four cyber uh, actors, and it's mostly, mostly the nation state um, malicious cyber actors that you're all familiar with. Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, uh, and then there's also some um, cyber activity from terrorist groups that our prosecutors uh, go after. And um, the criminal division is separately focused on um, cyber criminal actors around the world and have brought those cases for decades now. Now, security division is um, uh, newer, and uh, recently we stood up a um, now security cyber section that puts all those prosecutors together in one place to focus on those uh, nation state actors. Um, so with the criminal division and the national security division, we follow up on FBI investigations, but also the particular focus these days is on disrupting cyber activity um, before it occurs, um, because we have a, a focus on victims uh, in the United States and protecting those victims before their businesses are hit with ransomware, before critical infrastructure is taken down, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's our focus. Um, I work in a policy office uh, that's focused a lot on these regulatory issues, and Alan mentioned the SEC, new uh, cyber incident reporting rule, for example, 
And he referred to the fact that there's a specific national security and public safety delay uh, that allows uh, businesses to come to DOJ and ask for time uh, before they have to disclose th these incidents publicly uh, to their investors. The idea there is to make sure that systems can be um, as secure as possible before the bad guys know about these uh, disclosures as well, whether their um, malicious activity has been successful or whether they can perhaps um, take a vulnerability uh, that's disclosed publicly and uh, that they didn't know about and use it to their advantage. Um, so we're really focused on um, you know investigations, prosecution, but also disruptions these days in partnership with you all at uh, Cyber Command and other departments and agencies, and getting the word out through um, with our CISA partners to the private sector. I also want to put a plug in though for the um, civil division at DOJ, uh, which has an initiative called the Cyber Civil Fraud Initiative. And it's relatively new, it was announced during this uh, administration by the Deputy Attorney General uh, to focus on those companies that contract with the government when they do not adhere to the cybersecurity obligations uh, and they develop things such as insecure websites um, and other products that the government is spending a lot of money on, as you know, and so they should be held accountable if they are putting insecure products out uh, into the marketplace. So I, I, I made a note to talk about some um, specific examples. I'll limit it to one, but um, this one struck me as a particularly good uh, example, which was a company called Jelly Bean Communications Design. Uh, they were uh, contracted with the state of Florida because Florida receives uh, federal uh, health insurance money, and they were supposed to develop a website uh, called healthykids.org, and uh, they failed to secure personal information on this website, and it had to be shut down. So uh, DOJ reached a settlement in March of uh, 2023 with the company. Uh, they admitted that they failed to properly maintain, patch, and update software systems. Um, and so that's an example of where, you know, DOJ doesn't get into the regulatory world that we're talking about on this panel, but there is an enforcement mechanism that we're using more and more to try to maintain those minimum cybersecurity standards and make sure that companies live up to any contractual obligations. From the standpoint of the uh, private sector and companies that do business as contractors with the, the federal government, the uh, possibility of being uh, investigated for a contractual violation that could be considered uh, a, a matter of defrauding the government is really uh, kind of a, the interim effect of possible liability, either civil, there's criminal uh, dimension to False Claims Act, and, the, and but the, the current initiative, I believe, is a civil cyber fraud. But there are you know, potential criminal penalties and the possibility that f failing to provide to the government the contract, the cybersecurity commitments that are promised in accordance with a contract would be just a hellacious risk, that's the, the legal term, uh, for, for a company and would be taken really, a comp it is a way to boost compliance. Uh, I'll certainly uh, I, uh, add that. Oops. I'm gonna adopt that in my lexicon. Clients, uh, you are taking a hellacious risk. Hellacious risk, absolutely. Well, let me, tur let me turn back to you, if I may then, Spencer. Um, so one of the most intractable and difficult uh, harmonization problems that we're going to solve in a minute here, there's a statute that was uh, enacted by Congress in, in 2022, the Cyber Incident Reporting for Critical Infrastructure Act, C-I-R-C-I-A. Um, Spencer, firstly, can you tell us, and as part of explaining what your harmonization mandate is and what the DHS report is all about uh, regarding that, how do you pronounce the acronym? Good question, very good question. My folks are working on a memo on this, but we are hard on the Circia uh, pronunciation. You will hear Circia, I've heard Circia. And, we're, uh, we're very, and the director, the director would pronounce it how, Mr. Uh, Fisher? I'm not going to speak for the director. I will only say that she disagrees with me. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, already we've had a failure of harmonization. But tell us about the, the mandate that... Uh, so. 
<laughs> that you that you have under the 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 statute, which you'll pronounce Sirkia. Yep. It's correctly pronounced Sirsha, but okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, how uh, so? Tell us about the mandate, the DHS report, and and yeah, what, what, where that all stands. Sure. Um, so the the mandate really, you know, I was thinking about this. I knew that we were going to talk about it. Obviously, I mean, the the mandate itself is really uh, Congress intending to reduce duplicate reporting in the space, right? So we have critical infrastructure reporting. The the intention by uh, uh, you know, the congressional folks at the time was to reduce um, uh, duplication and, and actually, as we get back to the harmonization point, create harmonization with regard to critical infrastructure. So the enactment of CIRCIA marked an important milestone um, in improving cybersecurity. It requires CISA to develop and implement regulations requiring covered entities to report covered cyber incidents and ransomware payments to CISA. These reports will allow CISA to rapidly deploy resources and render assistance to victims suffering attacks, analyze incoming reporting across sectors to spot trends, and quickly share that information with network defenders and warn potential victims. So to address the potential for duplication um, uh, from, from other cyber incident reporting regimes, CIRCIA, uh, I almost, you almost got me. CIRCIA um, established uh, you know, one thing it established is the CIRC. I don't think there's any dispute about the CIRC, C-I-R-C, uh, and that is the Cyber Incident Reporting Council. So the CIRC is responsible for coordinating, deconflicting, and harmonizing federal incident reporting requirements, including those issued through regulations. Um, CISA act actively participated in the CIRC's processes to help identify potential approaches to harmonizing federal cyber incident reporting requirements and supported the identification of best practices um, that could be considered by CISA and other federal, federal departments and agencies as they develop or update cyber incident reporting regimes. Um, specifically, you know, CISA participated in various DH-led, DHS-led working groups, identifying potential recommended practices, um, and considers the DHS report and its recommendations um, uh, as we move forward to the extent practicable, practicable and consistent with the regulatory authority granted to CISA under CIRCIA. Um, so we're, we're working with the, the CIRC, also working to implement with our other uh, federal entities. Um, I can speak a bit more about CIRCIA if you'd like um, in more detail, but um, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll do right, well my... Maybe we, we can... Yeah, I'll do my disclaimer is just that the, the CIRCIA NPRM, so Notice of Proposed, proposed Rulemaking, uh, very recently went uh, out on the street, as it were. Um, so I'm not in a position um, to answer substantive questions about CIRCIA, but I'm happy to talk at a high level. Um, we do encourage folks that have comments or questions to submit them through appropriate channels, regulations.gov, um, uh, following the instructions that are laid out in the NPRM. But the, the most important thing, I think, is that I, I recommend everyone here read the NPRM. Um, it is uh, it is weighty. How many pages um, is it? It is somewhere near 500, but not quite at 500 pages. But I've read it several times. I but I it it it's one of those ones you put it in your hand and you're like this is like an A, right? A plus feels like an A. <laughs> um, but look, I, I I would commend everyone to read it because I think that um, it there are many questions, but they are in there, the answers are in there for folks to read, and, and um, we, you know, as I mentioned, the comment period is open for, for comments and questions at this time. So I'll leave it there with Sirkia, but we can, we can take questions about it later if you'd like. The, um, um, uh, the uh, what was I gonna say? So I think we've, we, we haven't quite got the, the acronym uh, resolved, um, but the other report, that I would also commend to your attention is the, the Department of Homeland Security's Harmonization Report. Even if you're not just interested... The CERC report right. that I mentioned, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Even if you're not interested in the harmonization question specifically, the annexes in particular for any cybersecurity practitioner are very useful in providing an inventory or catalog of different cybersecurity uh, uh, statutes and regulations in... I'm not sure how many agencies it is, 
Yeah, quite a few. Quite and, a few. And and that one's going to bring you into about 60 pages. So if you're looking for a little lighter... A little lighter read. The people, lighter weekend reading, the Circ Report. Yeah, our audience that's participating virtually has already started reading the 500 pages of the NPRM in lieu of listening to Let us. me know when you're done. So Pencils good, down. So good job there in turning them on to a really exciting uh, NPRM. Let me turn uh, back over uh, to, to Mike. Um, the, you know, we know that the White House National Cybersecurity Strategy and the implementation plan also focuses on uh, harmonization um, of, of cybersecurity regulations. We mentioned earlier the ONCD a report on uh, harmonization, the RFI, uh, that's pending. What are the interagency processes that, that the Department of Justice participates in these issues? Yeah, I went back and looked at where we are in this process, um, and Alan, that was a great introduction. I think you provided everyone on kind of where we currently are on looking at this challenge of how to harmonize uh, all the regulation out there. And um, so to remind everyone, there's a, um, you know, Biden administration cybersecurity strategy came out about two years ago, uh, and also there's public uh, an implementation plan. That's version one of the implementation plan. Version two is coming out shortly, I believe, and uh, the Office of National Cyber Director has done great work to um, put out these documents, keep everyone on track, and um, solicit input on the, the work that's being done, because if you don't make it public, no one knows about it out there. And I think what you saw from Congress with Circia, Circia was really a, a uh, desire that they knew it would be a game-changing law in terms of requiring more cyber incident reporting. Um, and they wanted to also focus the government on how to um, put out these regulatory requirements um, better so that, as Alan said early on, the focus is more on securing their systems rather than just complying with the uh, myriad of department agency requirements. So, uh, I wanted to get the name of this entity right, so I brought it with, brought some of my notes with me from the calls that uh, we've been having. The strategy uh, um, refers to the Cybersecurity Forum for Independent and Executive Branch Regulators. And these are all the regulators, like I think it's chaired by the FCC. Uh, SEC is, has been involved in some past calls because of their recent um, um, reporting requirement. But the goal is for this forum, and I, I call it the forum because it's a cool name, right? So the forum uh, gets everyone together, and CISA and DOJ are only advisory agencies because we don't have this independent regulatory authority. But the goal is to identify opportunities to harmonize baseline cybersecurity requirements. In particular, they want to focus on critical infrastructure. Um, now, a couple quick points that I think are important to make because not a lot has been um, put out publicly about what this group's doing, but uh, in some, we're trying to harmonize all the regulation out there. And it starts with one, there's a, a growing body of regulatory um, um, law and process out there, the SEC rule, for example. Two, as Spencer mentioned, there are different missions, different statutory authorities, different cybersecurity regulatory maturity for the different departments and agencies. So the forum is a venue for understanding how to achieve a desired regulatory end without introducing unintended burden to the industry. And I think that's what Congress had in mind when they required the CERC report that we were referring to. Um, so the forum is focused on how to define these common tenants and make recommendations to achieve the goal of more harmonization. And we're really focused on minimum baseline cybersecurity standards. Folks mentioned the NIST cybersecurity framework, and then Spencer also mentioned the cross-sector cybersecurity performance goals. So in sum, if these different regulators are all speaking the same language as to what they are gonna require from the different sectors and industries, then at least the companies, the lawyers they hire, like Alan, know that how to respond. And there's going to be a point where maybe uh, they don't have to respond to, you know, seven different agencies, uh, like send information to FBI, send information to CISA, send information to SEC, and make things public. 
you know, they can use the same body of work uh, that they have after an incident, for example, uh, or about how to secure their systems, and they can start to push, push that out to the departments and agencies simultaneously um, using some of the same terms or same, the, the CERC report talked about a similar form, yeah. really. So yeah, maybe that's where we end up. This is in line with the CERC report recommendations for streamlining, which is to, to come up with those definitions, um, you know, establish comparable timelines, and then adopt model incident reporting. So all of those things are, are in line with what the report uh, ended up you know, recommending uh, in that space. And again, the, this report is very useful because it doesn't just state the, you know, the ideal that there should be common lexicon and, and de definitions and that timelines ought to be reconciled and rationalized. It actually recommends what those definitions should be, what notifi how notification requirements and reports uh, should be, you know, templates. So model definitions, templates, possible timelines. The report acknowledges that some of its recommendations might require legislative action and not just regulatory. Picking up on what Mike said about this forum that you participate in, it's, um, in my experience at least, it's, it's uh, fairly unusual that you get a body in the ex executive branch uh, uh, on a regulatory uh, footing that includes the independent agencies like the Federal Trade Commission, the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, the, 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 the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and so on, that have authorities that overlap with standard executive branch agencies like the Department of the Treasury, Department of Homeland Security, uh, and so on. So getting the independent uh, agencies involved is actually in and of itself a harmonizing achievement because typically they see themselves, you know, they're independent, they're part of the executive branch, Article 2 of the Constitution, but in fact they don't view themselves as directly under the supervision of, uh, you know, the White House and Office of Management and Budget. So that in and of itself is a, it's a positive development. I'm not going to uh, go to questions from the audience just yet, but if you, if you have a question, just raise your hand now so I can gauge how many questions there are so we leave enough time. So n n not that many. Okay, they're, they're uh, still reading the uh, still reading the report. Yeah, NPRM. Well, they'll come back to us about the foot questions on the footnotes in the 500-page NPRM. So all right, so we can go uh, a, a little uh, longer. But if you do have questions, uh, feel free to ask them. I, I only see a couple uh, right now, and uh, I'll come back. Let me add a quick point on the what you mentioned about just the those independent regulatory. Um, bodies getting together as an achievement. That's good to hear because, um, you know, I, I see it that way. Um, and in particular, the circle report that Spencer mentioned, that 33 departments and agencies contributed to that report. So uh, that's an achievement also to, to have that many departments and agencies come up with some of the uh, recommendations together in a pretty concise uh, report for, for the subject matter. But I think what's driving a lot of this um, behind the scenes is that we all know cybersecurity standards are incredibly complex and the overall goal of the government is to get compliance with them and to be able to share information about these incidents. And so we know that it's incredibly difficult for the private sector, and um, certainly at DOJ, we think about it in terms of when you're victimized, you know, you don't want to have the next call from the government be, you know, 30 different agencies all requiring information from you. There really needs to be the overall goal of making things easier so that information can move quicker back to the government. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, uh, Spencer, let me ask you this, and Mike, if you'd like to comment. On, on the harmonization front, are there, are there any relevant distinctions that we would have in mind when the threat actor you're trying to protect against uh, is, is a nation state as opposed to when it's a, a, you know, a criminal organization? Um, look, I think in either case, you know, defending the, the nation against what are evolving cyber threats and attacks is, is really essential and it's at the core of CISA's mission. Um, we offer advisories, alerts, tools, resources, um, you know, all kinds of services and guidance on best practices to help network defenders and critical infrastructure implement preventative measures, manage cyber risks. Um, but the threat is is real, right? And and I come from a place where I looked at the threat quite a bit, and 
there are nation states and sophisticated sophisticated cyber actors that are looking to steal information, money, and developing capabilities to destroy, disrupt, and threaten the delivery of essential services. So defending against that is, uh, is essential to maintaining the nation's security. It's, it's part of the reason I wanted to work at CISA. Um, and any cyber attack, whether it comes from a nation state or whether it comes from a uh, private actor is, uh, a threat to national security and must be identified, managed, and shut down. Um, so cyberspace is, as Mike mentioned, particularly difficult to secure. Um, and there's an ability for malicious cyber actors to work from throughout the world. Um, there are linkages between cyber systems and physical systems, as we know, um, in, in the water sector and others. Um, and the difficulty of reducing vulnerabilities and consequences um, and implementing, you know, safe best practices is, is paramount. Um, but ultimately, the best practices are going to apply to any uh, threat actor of all types. And so while we need to be mindful of the ever-evolving landscape and kind of where these attacks are coming from, um, the requirements need to be uh, evergreen in that regard and, and they need to be uh, tailored so that we're mitigating the risk from whatever source. So Alan, let me make a quick plug here that um, originally our chief of staff, Brett Freeman, was scheduled to speak and a reason he, he wasn't able to come down is because negotiations are ongoing with FISA 702. So as we talk about the threat from nation state cyber actors, um, it's you know readily apparent that FISA 702 is an indispensable tool to develop the intelligence and lead toward the disruptions that we all need uh, to keep our country safe. So I wanted to make sure to put that, that plug in um, to both explain why I ended up as your speaker, but also um, on the importance of 702 currently being negotiated. Well, we're glad you're here, but also uh, hoping that 702 will uh, yield ultimately a compromise. It sort of looks like it's heading in that direction. The editorials in all the newspapers today are very uh, We, we hope so. Here, here. Yeah. Uh, definitely an important uh, legal authority, critical legal authority, uh, honestly. Um, so we have a number of other questions that we can address here, but uh, I think what I will do is go to the, I know there's one over here. If there are others, we'll take it, and then we can go back to our, our planned questions if there are no others. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, thank you. Um, first and foremost, uh, Spencer, um, there are other ways to solve insomnia than reading the 500-page <laughs> am, am I working for you? Multiple times, multiple times. It must not be working. But so um, I'm, I'm with Boise State University, and uh, I, I'm a 30-year practitioner. And one of the things that I would be really interested in understanding would be your perspective within the forum or individually, not necessarily the harmonizing of the regulatory effort from an incident reporting perspective, but actually on the front end, the protection, the detection, the monitoring piece. Um, in terms of the impact to, in, and, and specifically for this audience, because I suspect there are a number of people from procurement here, just as well as on the legal side, the impact of the CMMC, the impact uh, to the DIB of the CMM, CMMC, and other regulatory efforts placed upon industry from other entities. Do you see within these conversations the harmonizing of the actual control efforts and the type of, not just the reporting, but the actual control efforts so that, that the impact, especially to the SMB space within the DIB, it's minimized. Because that seems to be the, the major challenge that I've seen from my, my vantage point within the university ecosystem working with the DIB itself. Is that, that's for me? Yeah? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, so on the on the far piece, and I, I can't speak as much about the CMMC. I'm familiar, but not a not an expert. Um, and while DHS and CISA are not members of the FAR Council, CISA actively participates in the FAR Council and provides subject matter expertise. Um, the DFARS contains extensive cybersecurity requirements, uh, including the CMMC, um, and. CISA, I can point to a couple things that, that we've worked on. I mean, we've worked with the FAR Council on rulemaking efforts. This came out of the 
Cybersecurity EO 14028, um, providing initial recommendations for contract language. Um, and uh, the comment period for that recently closed. Um, but we did work to get that out there um, and came up with um, reporting requirements for contractors um, on federal systems operated on behalf of the government, um, requirements for SBOM, so software bill of materials, and then some very basic cyber hygiene requirements. So we are working in that space and, and we understand the, the piece that you're highlighting, the procurement piece and the, the importance of the FAR and the DFAR. Um, I'd also point to our work with the FAR Council on a proposed rule to require software, ven software vendors to attest to adherence to NIST um, software development standards. Um, so you may have seen CISA developed a template form uh, for those vendor attachments and that was came out I think about three weeks ago. Um, so CISA is active in this space. I mean, we, we fully understand the, the importance, although I would, I would say we're not a primary mover um, and that th there's folks in this room that are probably uh, eminently more familiar with the FAR and the DFAR than, than I would be or the CMMC. Okay, uh, one, uh, this may be the last question, sir. Yeah, hi, I'm Rich Giraud. I'm the legal counsel for the DOD Cyber Crime Center, which executes the, the mandatory reporting from the defense industrial base since 2016 by contract. Um, the first question I have, and really relates to this, this comment about uh, the complexity of cybersecurity. Well, to the extent that the government can sort of regulate cybersecurity standards with uh, the critical infrastructure, you know, it, it seems to me that the logical solution would be to work with the National Institute of Standards and Technology to keep their, you know, their definitions up to date so that they can be incorporated by reference. I mean, it will evolve. I mean, even the standards that are being used now are, are constantly evolving in, you know, sub subsequent issuances. Uh, this, the second question is, is even, even if you can get all of the harmonization of the reporting done, you've got a separate problem of sharing information. The information that the DOD gets has been available and is available now through, through Intel Share for, to everybody. And it can be used for any lawful government purpose, but a lot of people just don't know it's there. And so you've got to come up with some kind of a solution that can sort of push the data to whomever in government needs Let's to have it. Th th great question. Um, quick responses from uh, our two panelists, and then I think we're going to have to call it. Yeah, I'll just speak to the information sharing piece of your question. Did you say you're from DC3? Yeah, so very very advanced SRMA uh, with the DIB, and, and obviously I, I know you understand um, you know, the need for, for um, a, a mature approach to cybersecurity in that space. On the information sharing piece, I would just say that, that CISA has developed and implement, implemented numerous sharing programs. Um, uh, our automated information sharing comes from our CISA 2015 Act, which is, is voluntary reporting, but that information is shared automatically. Um, and then um, we do this you know, with partnerships as well. So we have the JCDC, the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative, where we unify cyber defenders to proactively gather, analyze, and share actionable cyber risk information. Um, and we encourage, uh, and we, I'm always prompted to do this, encourage folks to, to work with uh, information sharing processes and form relationships with our uh, uh, folks at CISA and within our regional offices throughout the country. We have 10 different regional offices throughout the country. Um, but take the point on information sharing, it's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I worked on uh, collection, retention, and dissemination for a very good part of my legal career, and I, I think that it, it is all vital and has to be done the right way, obviously. That's why we're here, that's why I have a chief counsel's office at CISA. That's why, uh, partly why we exist. Um, but, but take the point, and I would just say we are, we are working those processes uh, at CISA and fully appreciate the, the point of your question. Let me just put in a last plug. I know we've got, I've got to turn it over immediately, but the Cybersecurity, inf uh, the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act of 2015, which is what Spencer's referring to with CISA 2015, uh, it's uh, you know, awkward that both the agency and that stat information sharing statute, but those of you who are not familiar with the information sharing act of 2015 should re-familiarize yourself with it. It is a very useful tool for 
sharing uh, between public and private sector, and any agency can avail itself of it. And I believe the statute sunsets in 2025. So we'll start working uh, on it. Correct. Using it and promoting it. You are, I think, you are correct. I think we better turn it over. And thank you, uh, Spencer. Thank and you, Mike. Yeah. Alan, Spencer, Everyone. Mike. Thank you so much for helping us better understand the cyber regulatory landscape, the challenges we face in harmonizing those efforts, and the importance of partnerships to get us closer to harmonization. Uh, on a less serious note, this panel perfectly demonstrates the necessity of public-private partnership in cataloging and understanding government acronyms, and how do we avoid hellacious legal risk. So, gentlemen, thank you. You managed to turn a panel on regulation into something both informative and entertaining, A+. Plus. So please join me in a round of applause. And we are on break until 2.35 Eastern Standard Time. The Cyber National Mission Force, or CNMF, is a joint command available to U.S. Cyber Command to respond to its toughest challenges. 2024 marks the 10-year anniversary of the CNMF. U.S. Cyber Command established CNMF in 2014, recognizing the need for a force agile enough to respond to any crisis at any time, composed of highly trained and qualified cyber operators drawn from across the services. Today, the CNMF is composed of 39 joint cyber teams organized across six task forces consisting of soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, coast guardmen, guardians, and NSA, Air Force, and DIA civilians. CNMF's mission is to plan, direct, and synchronize full-spectrum cyberspace operations to deter, disrupt, and if necessary, defeat adversary cyber and malign influence actors. The CNMF conducts the full spectrum of cyberspace operations, consisting of offensive, defensive, and information operations. CNMF supports U.S. Cyber Command and national priorities, such as election defense, counter ransomware, global cyber security threat hunt operations, and other operations of national importance. CNMF works closely with other partners in the U.S. government. The CNMF routinely works with the FBI, DHS, NSA, and others to defend the nation. These partnerships are critical for this vital mission to defend the homeland. Each agency possesses differing authorities and capabilities. The ability to quickly share information, to leverage the proper authorities at the appropriate time, secures the nation and keeps our adversaries off guard, engaging them as far forward in cyberspace outside the United States. The CNMF is on the cutting edge of legal operations in the cyber domain. Since its inception, CNMF continues to drive the evolution of cyber operations. There has never been a better time to join the CNMF legal team. The Office of the Staff Judge Advocate, or OSJA, conducts the full range of legal operations, primarily focused on operational law. However, the office continues to provide advice across the legal disciplines. Individuals that join the CNMF OSJA must have a strong background in fiscal law, administrative law, international law, military justice, legal assistance, and of course operational law. The CNMF needs attorneys that are creative enough to link the various authorities together and present creative solutions to our clients. As a plank holder in the CNMF OSJA, you will have an opportunity to advise on unique and novel issues that have a direct impact on national events. There are few other organizations in the government where you will be exposed to the type of issues that we see on a daily basis. If you are a motivated legal professional that can work independently with little guidance, we would love for you to apply to become a member of the Cyber National Mission Force. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We can't talk about the power of partnerships without involving our international partners. We just had a panel discussion about the efforts within the United States to harmonize the regulatory efforts. So let's hear from some of our international partners about the friction points within their country and hopefully success stories of their partnering efforts both within their country and with other countries. I get to uh, introduce Captain Promotable Ray Macias, who I work with on a daily basis. He serves as a legal advisor 
uh, in the Office of the Staff Judge Advocate with me in the Plans, Policy, and Partnerships Law Division. So with that, Ray, I'll hand it off to you. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our legal conference. It is such an honor and a pleasure to be joined here by this outstanding group of panelists and leaders from across the country who we are privileged to also call our partners. You know, it's, it's a little hard to imagine any single one of us entering into a partnership without knowing some key information about the other party. You know, for example, you know, what are their, what's their history? What's their reputation? What are their capabilities? What's their intent? Can, can we even trust one another? Over the past day and a half, we've learned that so many of the challenges and opportunities that we face in cyberspace can be traced back to some law or policy or the lack thereof on, you know, fill in the blank. Um, while the bulk of our discussion has certainly approached these issues through a U.S. perspective, I assure you that this is not just a U.S. phenomenon. I think I can say with a fair degree of confidence that our international partners are having these exact same conversations back home. And so uh, as we explore the power of partnerships, I think the question then becomes, how well do we know our international partners' challenges in cyberspace and the domestic legal frameworks from which they're trying to resolve those issues? And perhaps more importantly, what can we as cyber and cybersecurity law attorneys do to help our organizations identify those legal endpoints as we explore international partnerships so that we can be more effective and efficient in achieving our shared goals? Over the next 50 minutes or so, uh, we're going to lean on this amazing group of individuals to help us better develop a common understanding of some of the different legal approaches to navigating our shared challenges in cyberspace. And so with no further ado, I'd like to introduce this amazing panel. Right here to my right, we have Ms. Chantelle Peterson. Ms. Peterson has served as a national security law and defense advisor for 20 years. She currently serves as the Deputy General Counsel for Intelligence, Legislation, and Policy with the Australian Signals Directorate. In the middle, we have Lieutenant Colonel Nick Volma. That is a Wobma for those of us who speak American. Colonel Wobma brings over a decade of experience in national security and cyber law. He is a member of the Netherlands Royal Army and currently serves as the Deputy Law Branch Head and Legal Researcher at the NATO Cooperative Defense Center of Excellence. And last, but certainly not least, we have on the far right, Ms. Grete Tumpere. Um, she serves as a legal advisor to the Estonian Defense Forces uh, Cyber Command. Her portfolio includes international and domestic cyber law and policy, and she previously assisted in drafting the Estonian Cybersecurity Act. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause to our international partners on stage and to all of our international partners who are able to join us today. All right, so let's get to work. Um, this is an open question for all of our panel members, and that question is based on the following. So y'all have had a chance to develop a better sense of the complex ecosystem of state and non-state actors involved in US cyber defense. Who are some of the key national players in your countries? And in what ways are your national cyber defense legal authorities or frameworks different from ours here in the United States. Um, Ms. Peterson, would you like to kick us off? Sure. I might just start with two points. I'm attending the panel in my personal capacity, so please don't take what I say as representing either the Australian Signals Directorate or the Australian Government. The next point is hello to all my Australian colleagues who have told me that they're dialing in on the Eastern Seaboard in Australia. It's about 4 a.m. in the morning, so thank you. Um, so within the Australian ecosystem, the Australian Signals Directorate is responsible for cyber operations and for delivering inv oh, can't talk. innovative offensive cyber capabilities. So through Project Red Spice, which was announced last year, um, this will triple our offensive cyber capabilities. And this is being used to support Project Aquil Aquila where ASD, so Australian Signals Directorate, and the Australian Federal Police conduct cyber operations to combat criminal, 
oh, sorry, to conduct criminal investigations and towards work towards prosecution and or disruption of cybercrime activities. So this operation focuses on the highest cyber security threats to Australia, driving both from national threats and internationally. Um, in terms of how the frameworks differ, they definitely do. Um, and so the Australian Signals Directorate operates under its own statute, um, the Intelligence Services Act, and that sets out our statutory functions which guide what we can and can't do <coughs> and sets out the powers that underpin it and the authorities that we need to seek to be able to conduct those activities. That's probably and so, Ms. Peterson, is there sort of a constitutional framework that exists to support those authorities or the implementation of those uh, cyber defensive capabilities? So under the Australian system, you have the Australian Constitution, which has powers that vest in the federal government in relation to defence and national security, and we have a concept of executive power. Um, and it's through the federal parliament that sets the legislation that gives us those powers to conduct the activities. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Shall I, shall I continue? So, um, hello everybody. Um, let me also start with a, a small disclaimer. Um, I'm here today as uh, representing the law branch of the Cyber Center of Excellence, NATO CCDCOE. Um, I have worked at NATO as a legal advisor and I have worked uh, as a Dutch uh, Cyber Command legal advisor, but these are experiences in the past, so I'm not current with that, but I will, however, uh, when relevant, tap into my own experience in the past to help paint a picture of uh, the question. So, um, about that picture, uh, in Holland, the Netherlands, we have a um, so-called administrative leg uh, legality principle. So that means, in short, and this may sound similar to what you have, but um, uh, this means, in short, that every government organ is, uh, has a legal basis upon which to build, a legal basis that tells them why are we here and what are the rules that govern us, this specific agency. So there are many agencies, and they all have their own specific task that is laid down in law, regulations, or the Constitution. Um, on the other side is civilians, and by... Uh, extension also private companies they can do basically anything as long as it's not forbidden by any regulation or law so that's they operate all in a different way and have all their specific tasks and that comes with challenges and opportunities which we probably talk about later um, so to go further deeper into that landscape uh, who is doing cyberspace operations and then I'll keep it short to the the ones that typically would focus outside of their own networks and not on the, the own networks. That would be, um, of course, law enforcement, who have their own legal basis and legal framework b built around suspicion of a crime and uh, have the authorities and mandate to act upon it. Then we have the intelligence services, the general intelligence service and the military inter intelligence service with their own legal framework and own specific tasks within those uh, uh, laws. Um, and then there is the armed forces who have a constitutional, well, a variety of constitutional tasks. Um, and among them would be uh, not just to prepare for, for actual combat, but also to engage in it. And depending on the mission mandate, I'm, I'm probably not telling anything new here, but depending on the mission mandate, they will get their own set of rules and, and, and regulation. But that um, legal framework changes depending on the mission. And there is no standing law that governs uh, um, um, well, there are some fragments, but uh, typically there is no standing law that says you have the ongoing mandate to engage in uh, offensive cyber. So, sir, to follow up on something you mentioned earlier, you said that there's a little bit more leverage or latitude for the private sector actors under, under, under the applicable domestic law. If a private sector technology company is hacked, can they hack back against the state actor? Well, there is a leeway uh, for, for different actors. They have their own, uh, as you said. However, um, if you are a piece of the government and you have a certain task, you cannot ask somebody else who has more leeway to do it for you because that would be uh, yeah, out of the question, really. How however, um, it's a fact that private companies sometimes already have uh, eyes on things that uh, as a government actor, you're still thinking about, do I have the mandate or who do I call? So. Um, and that can lead to situations that are uh, beneficial, yeah. 
Oh, very from helpful. an Intel perspective. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Tumpere? Sure, I'll, I'll continue. Um, is, is the mic on? Yes, hi. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, this is new for me. I feel like a pop star. So, uh, and I've, I've never uh, been uh, live streamed before. So, hi, mom, and uh, all my fans out there. Um, but all jokes aside, um, uh, thank you. It's, it's an honor to be here. And I will also be speaking uh, on behalf of my own uh, capacity and rely on my, uh, my knowledge. So, um, uh, turning to the question. Then uh, Estonia is also um, um, similarly to the Netherlands, um, uh, distinguishing civilian side and also the armed forces and military side uh, of of the networks that uh, and and the parameters they uh, they are allowed to engage in. So uh, for the civilian sector, um, uh, we have a separate cybersecurity act that. Uh, defines the roles and also uh, we have distinguished vital services and the sen essential functions that um, have their own mandate and uh, fall, uh, fall under uh, the Civilian um, Information Security Authority who will uh, conduct um, uh, the uh, cybersecurity part of it. Uh, and then of course there's the military side uh, with their own uh, cyber defense uh, mandate and uh, and in addition uh, since we are a very small uh, nation <laughs> only 1.3 million uh, then uh, we need to be clever uh, in um, organizing ourselves uh, so um, we have um, um, a separate uh, um, organization uh, it's still a public entity uh, and it's called the Defense League, uh, which means that it gathers together uh, various, um, I personally like to, like to call them defense enthusiasts. Uh, they, uh, they use their free time and spare time to, to uh, allocate themselves and, uh, and commit to training and exercising. And that, under that Defense League, they also have a separate cyber defense unit which uh, gathers together um, uh, various um, cyber security specialists that on a daily basis work in different companies or even in uh, public sector. Uh, and uh, on, on their spare time, uh, <laughs> they, uh, they exercise together and they are uh, part of our reserve. So in a way, this is um, um, an effort to, to reach out uh, and uh, and gather as much potential as we have because uh, uh, we need to retain that uh, capability set we have. I, I really like that. I think it's, it's so interesting for us. The follow-on question to that is this volunteer group, are they putting military uniforms on at any point or are they completely in a civilian capacity? Mm, depends on the function and depends on the assignment. Um, uh, we do uh, exercises together and we do training together um, and that uh, that unit also has uh, legal advisors in it so uh, we are uh, collectively um, teaming up uh, it, at an upcoming exercise actually uh, and um, they normally most of them are our own reserve uh, reservists, so they have uniform and they they are obliged to wear it when they are coming to the exercises. Uh, but that requires a formal request uh, beforehand, uh, and um, uh, they they still maintain also their civilian capacity as well. But um, in a way, they still feel like they have more to give and contribute. And that's why they, they have uh, formed this separate unit. Fascinating insights, and I appreciate you sharing that, which is actually a great segue to, to my next question for the group. Uh, also an open question, and so, um, Ms. Tumpere, you mentioned something about how, how, how Estonia is bridging the gap between the private sector, you know, private sector actors to help support some of these larger challenges. The question for the group is, um, you know, in a few words, can you describe uh, some law and policy issues your 
your nations are navigating to overcome some of those shared challenges, and how have you resolved them uh, to help bridge that gap? Um, anyone who's willing or interested to jump in, you're welcome to. Again, um, so talking about uh, obstacles and opportunities. Um, well, given the, the the different legal bases that I talked about before, they also function as kind of walls between the various agencies, and um, that makes it sometimes hard to communicate. However, the opportunities also present themselves in the cooperation, um, and think of developing common capabilities. Think of um, we're all fishing in the same pond for uh, a scarce cyber staff and uh, we want to make it interesting without stealing each other's personnel. Think about uh, gathering intel that can be useful for various operations under different mandates. So these are opportunities. However, as long as you have the walls, you don't know what the other is doing and you may be inefficient or do things twice or three times or many times over. So I feel as legal advisors, first legal advisors, uh, we, we, we try to look for the doors within these walls and try to open them so that uh, communication can start. I heard the general say in the opening speech yesterday that you have LNOs at all the various agencies. I think that's, that's wonderful and essential. Um, also, not just LNOs, but um, legal advisors uh, having on the operational level, but also on the senior leadership level, uh, forums where they engage on a regular basis. Um, also having joint exercises or joint executions of that uh, what we are talking about, the intel gathering, capability building, that kind of thing, that are all opportunities that work to more and lesser degree. There's been a lot of, you know, like bureaucratic hiccups along the way, um, but I'm happy to say that it is very much improving and that there are successful uh, joint uh, things come out of that. So, um, let me see. Um, yeah. That, that's what I wanted to say. Very helpful. Yeah. Um, Ms. Peterson, would you like to share any insights? Absolutely. I might just talk first quickly about the relationship building that ASD is undertaking as part of its cybersecurity partnership program. So we run this pro, sorry, ASD runs this program. It has three tiers of membership, the network partners, business partners, and home partners. And those three levels of partnership have different levels of access to information and the key focus is on network partners where we share threat intelligence and engage in a range of other collaborative activities. Um, network partners include government agencies, private industry who uh, maintain IT security personnel and are able to act on threat intelligence. They include cybersecurity specialist businesses who are able and willing to share their specialist expertise on a not-for-profit basis with that partnership community and also academia, research and other non-profit organisations who have that you know, keen interest and um, dedication to cyber security. Now, obviously one of the challenges that has been spoken about on this conference is the willingness to share sensitive threat intelligence with industry and for industry to feel comfortable sharing information that might come close to their confidential business information. So the network partnership program is underpinned by non-disclosure agreements, which helps build that trust. Um, the partnership program has regular meetings, collaboration that's undertaken both virtually and in person through program offices that ASD runs in and across Australia. Um, so that was one of the challenges that we've experienced. And ASD has built up some really strong relationships with the private industry through this process. However, when it comes to cyber incident response, unsurprisingly, one of the first hurdles we faced was I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to talk to you, my lawyer said so. Um, because there was a real concern that if they were sharing at that critical moment information, that that information could then be passed on and used by regulatory or law enforcement agencies and escalate the legal liability that the company who's already suffered a cyber incident or a cyber attack uh, might be liable to. And so under the 
Australian Cybersecurity Strategy, which was also released last year, one of the mechanisms that the Australian Government is bringing forward is a legislative limited use obligation on ASD and also Australia's Cybersecurity Coordinator to help industry feel a level of trust that they can share that information quickly with government so that they can get the support in responding to the incident, you know, at the speed of relevance, not just at the speed of trust. Um, without it then being handed over rapidly to regulatory and law enforcement. Now, you would have heard the term safe harbour in one of the earlier sessions. This is not a safe harbour program. This does not provide them with absolute liability that may have arisen through their non-compliance with their obligations. There is still the ability for regulators to use their powers of investigation and apply regulatory sanctions where sanctions are required. Um, so this is still in development, so I can't tell you exactly what it looks like, um, but it is one of those mechanisms that we're bringing forward to address obstacles to collaboration. You know, th those are great insights, and, and you know, as we're talking about these issues, I'm hearing a number of parallels, but different ways of approaching and navigating those challenges. Um, Ms. Jumpy, I wanted to start with you on the next question, because I think this is a good uh, way to transition. Uh, earlier this morning, we heard uh, Director Coker talking about developing norms of cyber behavior. Okay, so Estonia has a unique relationship with its private sector, and it's it's a general population. You're a smaller country, and so you were saying we have to find innovative ways of of preparing ourselves for for the worst, right? And so the question is, um, what? Um, how how do you how does your country or how do your all's countries approach uh, reinforcing norms of responsible state cyber conduct by and through private parties or private sector partners? Well, that's um, that's that's an interesting um, uh, approach. Uh, if uh, if we are thinking through the private uh, um, companies, then. Um, Overall, I would say that uh, we are very uh, digital and uh, also highly dependent on it, uh, meaning uh, most of our public services are uh, available uh, to uh, available online, except for two, you cannot um, marry online and, uh, and uh, register a person's death online. Uh, other other uh, uh, services are all, um, available online, so which means that uh, private uh, companies are facilitating those services because, um, uh, well, this is the the most essential partnership aspect uh, that uh, w where the private companies are stepping in, because well, although those are public services, they still run on uh, the private. Um, uh, uh, in networks and, and, and the infrastructure that still allows the, the services to run. And um, when thinking about norms um, from an international law perspective, <laughs> then uh, norms uh, are not so much uh, implemented on the private, uh, private partners or private companies, uh, rather than um, uh, thinking of uh, public attribution for uh, ongoing attacks or, or conducted operations already. So uh, this is one of the aspects where, uh, where the reinforcement or enforcing uh, can, uh, can be seen. But from, um, uh, from organizing public-private partnerships and also enhancing that, then uh, I would say that it's, um, it's not so much regulated on a legal basis uh, rather than it's it still comes down to the tactical level where uh, the information is exchanged and, and also incidents are quickly responded and uh, the necessary assistance is also given uh, through various uh, partners and, uh, and players on the field. Very helpful. Um, sir, ma'am, and any thoughts on, on how, how, how you all handle uh, reinforcing norms of responsible state cyber conduct? Well, I can say something about that as well. Um, last year, uh, the 
So first of all, uh, for the armed forces in the constitution, one of the tasks of the armed forces in the Netherlands is to promote international uh, rule-based order. So um, that's also one of the things we focus on, generally speaking. Um, but more broader, the Netherlands last year had, uh, together with the Republic of South Korea, uh, a re-aim. So that was a responsible artificial intelligence uh, in the military domain conference. There will be a follow-up this year in Korea, um, which tries to engage with key actors uh, in, in, in order to uh, develop norms, uh, including the private sector. Uh, we have been active also in, in cyber, as you may know. Uh, we've been pushing, uh, been one of the pushing countries for uh, in the UNDDs and the open-ended working group, as well as uh, the talent manual uh, processes. So for us, it is very important. So under our cybersecurity strategy, one of our actions is to shape, uphold and defend international cyber rules, norms and standards. This includes actively participating in international forums and assisting our regional partners to build capabilities to counter cybercrime and also have a voice and participate in those forums. Um, great insights, everybody. I appreciate you sharing those thoughts. Um, I want to touch base in, in trying to do a little bit of a compare and contrast of another challenge that we identified earlier today, and that's that's the issue of talent management. And, and here in the United States, as you heard uh, Director Coker mention, um, we're trying to find innovative ways of, of building up our national cybersecurity workforce. Um, how are your countries navigating this problem? Is this even a problem for you all? Um, and, and if so, what are the creative solutions that you all have come up with? Well, it's certainly a problem that's shared world round. Um, and uh, you would have heard me mention at the start of this panel the project Red Spice, where we're looking to triple our offensive cyber capability. We're also building our workforce and aim to have at least 40% of our workforce outside of our nation's capital spread around Australia. Um, so this poses a couple of challenges. Obviously, workforce shortage is one of them. Um, and to meet that, and part of the plan of having, I should say, our workforce spread around Australia is both to help address the workforce shortage and to build resilience in the way we conduct business. Um, it gives us access to broader talent pools by having our offices spread around the country. But we're also looking at, and we've already started, to have a multi-classification workforce. So our facilities that we're building a multi-classification and we have a multi-classification workforce so that people can do work on lower classified systems in lower classification buildings um, and there's no requirement to pass the very lengthy top secret positive vetting process prior to being able to start work with the Australian Signals Directorate and so we've managed to already quite rapidly expand our numbers. Very impressive, thank you for sharing that. Uh, folks, any uh, any other insights? Yeah, um, I, I can add on to that. Um, uh, we are, um, well, we've heard this um, uh, mentioned during today and, and also yesterday that uh, people are the most important um, uh, assets and I couldn't agree more. Uh, and um, and we, we need to put our efforts and we need to invest in them uh, so uh, so we we can have the c capabilities and and just build on that so um, in Estonia we are uh, implementing um, cyber conscription uh, so um, it, it means that uh, all mandatory uh, recruit recruits are going through the basic soldier training but they also afterwards uh, if if they apply uh, to the Cyber Command, uh, they will conduct an IT and cybersecurity test uh, where um, the brightest are selected <laughs> uh, and uh, they are um, uh, assigned to different uh, units uh, doing IT support or help desk or, uh, or even programming developing. And from there on, they can uh, build and uh, and build their own capacities and and uh, also uh, move on uh, during the conscription service period and also one of the um, 
uh, ongoing um, uh, initiatives that we have is to uh, allow um, um, various students in different programs in u universities to do their internship in the cyber command uh, in exchange for um, credit points for for their uh, studies so uh, th well these are case case by case spaces uh, usually uh, <coughs> and um, and we have established um, um, an, an ongoing uh, collaboration with various uh, education institutions so uh, so we we are very much focusing on how to build up the workforce and also retain it but we will never I mean the public sector can never compete with the private sector uh, naturally but we are doing our best and uh, we try to be as appealing as possible um, and uh, we also contribute well from the military side uh, to to various initiatives for um, uh, for students and um, uh, different programs where they uh, are testing their knowledge uh, and uh, sort of exercising ethical hacking. So uh, we are partnering also in that at that sphere. So uh, this mm -hmm. is one of the um, uh, unique <laughs> um, uh, approaches. I'm, I'm fascinated by this idea of, of the cyber conscription. Um, sir, is there something similar uh, in, in uh, with the Netherlands? Yes, we put a lot of um, faith and hope <laughs> in uh, our uh, bond with the uh, reservists in, in, in crafting a, a big network of active reservists that we can call upon. Um, and of course, it's very important to g engage in good relationships with employers. So we have uh, annual uh, gatherings where we try to involve companies and explain the, the necessity of having reservists, especially with uh, ICT personnel. And uh, so that project is quite successful. Um, we have about, well, we have an amount of reservists uh, now employed who have uh, various uh, speci specialties. And well, so that, that is, been an important development uh, in, in involving more um, the, the private sector and, and getting more capacity. Fantastic, sir. And, and, and while you still have the microphone, um, so I appreciate you sharing your perspective, you know, for, for the nation perspective, national perspective. Uh, I think a number of us are familiar with the CCD COE, and, and I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about your work with the organization and um, some of the research and initiatives that you all are undertaking to help try to bridge that gap to develop better public-private partnerships. Right. Yes. So um, the NATO CCDCOE, the Corporative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence, took me a couple of years before I got that uh, flowing. Um, we, we try to uh, promote cooperation. We have about 39 uh, member states, uh, of which about a fourth is uh, non-NATO, but partner nations like yours. Um, we have various initiatives in the past that I'm sure you're all well aware of, um, but uh, currently, I think next week we will um, we will uh, start a project called uh, Handbook on State Positions. We have received uh, grants in order to further that. Not just us, but it's alongside um, Exeter University, the Chatham House, uh, the government of Estonia and Japan uh, to uh, further this handbook, which will enable states to, uh, that don't have state positions on cyber, enable them to, to make it easier for them policy-wise and uh, also show what other nations that have a state position have done so that they can uh, uh, use that. Then uh, we will also start with a handbook on data protection in armed conflict. This is still uh, uh, in, in the beginning phases, but now we're looking for writers uh, who can help with this uh, handbook. The, s the commanders, cyber commanders handbook uh, will be uh, revised and uh, into made into a 2.0 version, as you have heard before. Um, so these are on the academic side initiatives. Then, of course, uh, we have Lock Shields coming up, where we try to work with. I think now it's 39, oh no, 38 nations in, uh, in well, a lot of teams that uh, will work together to also Lock do the legal is an exercise. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Lock Shields is an exercise, I should say. We have two big exercises. Lock Shields is one of the crown jewels. And um, this year will be the first time that it will set in an armed conflict. 
so that will also make for a very interesting legal track. I'm a bit biased because I'm leading the track, but uh, I'm just uh, promoting it as well. And finally, um, yeah, we we have of course the, the international law course um, where with with various esteemed professors that have teached there in the past, and um, that can uh, I, that I can recommend to all the lawyers that want to learn more about cyber and international law. Thank you very much. Now, I, I, I imagine some folks in the audience probably have some questions, but I have one more question for you all. And and what I'm looking for is, is your perspective, your individual perspective. Um, our opportunity to work together and have these conversations has been very eye-opening, and I imagine it's probably been very eye-opening for, for some of the folks in the audience and the folks that are visiting us uh, and joining us online. Um, but from your experience, working with international partners, um, how can international legal practitioners work together to enhance mission delivery and accomplish shared goals? How can lawyers help bridge that gap and improve partnerships between the public and private sector, but more importantly in this context with our international partners? Um, maybe we just go down the line. Ms. Peterson, any thoughts? Certainly. I have four words. Be curious, ask questions. Um, so we already collaborate really well. Um, after all, there's a reason we often call each other like-minded and often we have something in connection with any of the partners that we're choosing to undertake an activity with. However, our strength also lies in diversity. We are different nations. We have different legal systems. We have different cultural backgrounds. Um, and it's from that diversity that we draw our strength and I just want to borrow the words of Judy from yesterday, which is same, same, but different. You know, we're all on the same page, but how we get there sometimes is different. Um, so I would say we can enhance our mission delivery by being actively curious about each other's legal systems, um, operational capabilities, and therefore what we can and can't do. So for any particular mission or program, we can draw together those individual pieces of the puzzle to create a single uniform picture of where we want to be when we achieve that outcome. Wonderful, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, sir, what are your thoughts? To end where I uh, started, and I'll try to look in the camera this time. Um, as I said in the beginning, there is a lot of walls between agencies and there is on the other, uh, well, not necessarily the other side, but in the private sector, there is also uh, a different way that uh, uh, things work. And what is very important in this is that uh, people know who they are going to work with. If you are going to cooperate as a company with a certain segment of the government, it's very important also to know what that segment is responsible of. And at the same time, from the government perspective, it's you, you really need to know who you are going to work with and what, especially what your requirements are, because if you know what you need, then it's very a lot easier for the company to be able to um, do what you want them to do. And this applies no less in the international sphere. It's it's also it's it's know who you are, are going to be uh, together with. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing that. And last but not least, Ms. Tumpere. Yeah. I, w I would just add on to that, uh, that just uh, an idea that uh, kind of resurfaced <laughs> in my head earlier. It was, it's um, variety and riches. So we should still maintain what we have, but also, like you said, be curious and um, uh, respect, respectful for, for each other. So. Thinking back to my um, uh, previous positions and, and the things I've worked on, uh, I would say that um, education and training is also one of the avenues uh, and, uh, and co cooperative exercising as well uh, is, is one of the avenues where uh, we can um, come together and, and learn from each other uh, and pass on the knowledge that we have. So this is uh, one of the ways to, uh, to ensure uh, variety and riches. Thank you very much. This has been an extraordinarily illuminating conversation. We really do appreciate you all coming to share these perspectives. Um, I want to keep the conversation going, and I'd like to invite members of the audience, if they have any questions for our partners, 
And if there's questions that may be for some of our other international partners that you can answer, uh, why don't we just open the floor for that? So any questions uh, for the panel members? I see back in the top left. Um, sure, we'll start back there. Thank you, panel, for traveling uh, to speak with us. Uh, are there international norms that you'd want to see uh, surrounding artificial intelligence? And how do you think those norms should be achieved? Sure. Well, why not? <laughs> um, I think uh, the AI has been uh, one of the burning topics uh, uh, throughout this conference. And uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I've, I've been um, involved in, uh, in different projects where uh, AI and the legal regulations have been uh, under discussion. So one of the aspects that we have uh, tackled with was do we need a national defense exception? And how far are we going to regulate it? So internationally, I would say um, we, we do need guidance, uh, but not necessarily in a normative way, which will restrict our uh, own um, um, uh, movements or uh, just uh, capabilities. So, if, if that's okay. so yeah, yesterday um, I heard, which was also, uh, but it has definitely merits, um, that for innovation, too much rules is not good. But uh, I would also, maybe I don't want to sound too much like a European, but uh, uh, rules also provide a certain amount of predictability for, for governments and for, for citizens in order to work with what we have. So um, I would applaud uh, a basic rule set. And the EU has, as you all know, recently adopted uh, the start of it. So, yeah. I might answer the first part of your question so slightly differently because um, we are participating in the Council of Europe AI convention discussions um, and have very similar considerations. But in terms of other norms that we're interested in maintaining, um, we're very, very interested in continuing to defend an open, free, secure and interoperable internet um, through those international forums to make sure that it doesn't become under the control of any single nation state um, and continues to be um, that domain which is so unique um, and has all of our private and public partnerships um, maintaining it. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Right here in the back, back in the center. Yeah. Um, are you aware of any standing international agreements either NATO, ANZUS, or for Australia, particularly Five Eyes, that would allow bulk reciprocal sharing of cyber incident data, either from government networks or contractor network cyber incidents? No. I'm not tracking any treaty level documents that would expressly permit it, but I'm not tracking any that would prohibit it either. Um, and so, there's already a range of arrangements between Five Eyes governments to enable us to work interoperably. Um, so I'm not sure that we need a treaty to be able to achieve that amongst um, the Five Eyes partners. To add uh, from the NATO side, um, as I said, I've not been working there for a while, but I know that already when I was working there, there are various information sharing agreements, incident sharing uh, um, uh, constructs. Um, also in the yearly cyber coalition exercise that we do, it's a NATO exercise, flagship cyber exercise. Uh, we practice this and we, we share information and incidents uh, and, and, and we use the systems that we created uh, to that purpose. I can see another hand over here, sir. Thank you. Uh, I know this mentions, or this panel is on international perspectives, but I have a, a question about your, your respective nations, your respective countries that might have international applications. Estonia, Netherlands, the Scandinavian countries, you serve as a model because you are some of the most extensively wired societies, if not in, certainly in Europe, if not the world. I think Estonia, you are probably one of a model of extensive interconnectedness uh, in terms of the internet and cyber activities. 
despite the fact that you're 1.3 million. You're also the safest. You also rank Netherlands, Estonia, the Scandinavian countries rank as the safest in terms of how little or relatively few uh, cyber attacks you experience in your society. But what you share in common are your relatively small populations and your relatively homogenous societies. Do you believe that your success would be limited in trying to transfer your success to much larger states like a United Kingdom, uh, perhaps, uh, or, 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 or more diverse or larger state or country like Australia, that there might be limits to your success because your success is really the result of your smaller populations and, and relatively smaller geographic locations. So that you'll, no matter what you can do, if you have a larger population, larger state, the cyber attacks will, will persist. Yeah, that's that's true. Thank you for the question. And um, uh, well, <laughs> well, there could be several reasons why uh, why those uh, attacks have uh, decreased. But in fact, I, uh, as much as I recall, it was last year. Um, the similar attacks that happened in Estonia in two thousand seven um, that were sort of the pivotal uh, turning point for for especially for from NATO cyber policy. Uh, the same kind of uh, denial of service attacks were uh, 50 times uh, stronger and um, and more advanced. So time is moving on, and um, I wouldn't say that we're not experiencing uh, uh, so so few uh, attacks. We we do have um, uh, a large number number of incidents uh, happening quite often and frequently. And uh, in terms of size and scale, uh, the, the size of our um, uh, nation and also the interconnectivities, it, it can be seen as a benefit, but it also can be a disadvantage uh, in various aspects. So I, I'm not so sure how it translates to a, a larger nation, but what I do can compare is um, is that uh, sometimes it seems a bit overlooked uh, that um, if uh, in comparison to US, you have a, a floor full of teams uh, with lawyers and, uh, and specialists working on uh, different projects than back home, back in my country, there's uh, likely only one person uh, in that team. So uh, we, uh, we do need to, um, uh, set our priorities because otherwise we would be uh, a bit overwhelmed. So uh, I'm uh, I'm sorry to say I don't I don't really have an answer how to uh, transpose and translate our experience to a larger country and and uh, we just um, need to be vigilant. I would say. Um, so not to come to the defense of the Netherlands, even though it is my job. Um, we are about 13 times the population of Estonia and about a fourth of Germany. Um, that doesn't make us necessarily a big country, but it is definitely a multinational country. And um, I think the reason for it being, I, I take it, uh, relatively uh, safe is not so much in the homogeneousness of the country, but more... Uh, we have a very open policy. We thrive on trade. We, we, ideally, everything is open, open trade, and uh, that's how we not only make our money, but that's also um, what we like to promote. And in order to do that, in order to have a society like that, you also need to make friends everywhere. And if you have friends everywhere, you have less enemies. Um, so uh, that's a very simple answer to a probably way more uh, complicated uh, problem. But I, I, I think it can be the start of a right answer. Yeah. Thank you, sir, great question. Uh, any other folks? I think I saw another hand out in the audience. Yep, right over here, sir, on the right side. Yes, um, I was wondering, um, in Estonia with um, <coughs> world events going on so much um, with um, the war in Ukraine and things like that and Russia so close by, has that caused any changes in, in uh, 
the, the statutes have been enacted and things like that. Have there, have there been any legislative changes important since the since the Ukrainian war started? For cyber. <laughs> hmm. Well, uh, as uh, as I'm trying to uh, organize my thoughts, <laughs> thank you for the question. <laughs> uh, the um, uh, war in Ukraine has um, uh, has certainly had its impacts, um, and I would say um, domestically and nationally, we are um, we're being rational and we are implementing the same vigilance uh, that we used to. And from a cyber perspective, uh, we are um, from uh, di different, through different mechanisms, uh, we are facilitating IT support and also um, other services uh, to help Ukraine um, restore uh, their uh, critical infrastructure and also uh, main maintain its functionality. So we are contributing, but from a legal perspective, I wouldn't say that uh, we have not have, we haven't made any, any regulatory uh, changes uh, since, uh, since the kinetic part of the war. And folks, I think we just have a couple more minutes left. Maybe one more question. Any more questions from the audience? Maybe up in the balcony? Uh, right up front. Yes, ma'am. Um, kia ora. You talked a little bit about how countries' legal differences in their systems and stuff uh, needs to be considered and addressed when working together in this area. Um, but I was wondering if you had any thoughts about not necessarily legal differences, but like cultural and historical differences that have the way they impact a society and maybe how those uh, differences between nations need to be addressed when dealing with cyberspace, if that makes sense, sorry. O open question for anybody, ma'am? Yeah, okay, great question, thank you. I think some of the cultural differences can boil down and flow into the policy stance that the different countries take and also their risk appetites for certain types of activities and where they draw the lines with those activities. So sometimes the national caveats that we put um, when acting together aren't drawn from our law, they're drawn from what's societally acceptable to our communities. And I think that holds true for cyberspace operations as well. <laughs> I was uh, I was just uh, thinking of um, uh, well from a personal perspective. I mean, um, uh, the one of the cultural aspects that we are trying to implement is um, is a broad uh, security and national defense concept, which means that um, every uh, vital service uh, provider uh, has their peacetime duties that they need to fulfill and also uh, um, implement during crisis and war. And also we are uh, including civilians uh, in, uh, in armed forces, uh, especially I'm, I'm the greatest example of, uh, of being a civilian and working with the armed forces and cyber command. And uh, this is one of the aspects that is really enforcing and and trying to um, to uh, to highlight the cultural difference and it and I'm the example that it, it works it, there's uh, there's nothing um, uh, uh, so far at least <laughs> there hasn't been any, anything uh, anything uh, uh, bad about it so it's it's uh, still like I said, uh, variety and riches. Um, Ms. Peterson, Colonel Volma, and Ms. Tumpere, thank you very much, folks. Can you join me in giving them one more round of applause for joining us here? Thank you.
Thank you, Greta, Nick, Chantel, and Ray. We've talked a lot about the power of trust, and one way of building that trust is taking this type of opportunity to compare and contrast our policy and legal frameworks and ultimately learning from one another. As Chantel said, same, same, but different. So while we all have our own unique challenges, it is comforting to know that we are all grappling with similar issues. So thank you again to our international panelists and to all of our international participants who took the long journey to join us for this Cyber Command Legal Conference. We will be on break until 1545 for our final capstone of the day. Thank you. Hi, I'm Colonel Pete Hayden, and I'm excited to speak with you as a part of the U.S. Cyber Command Legal Conference. Whether you are in person or virtual, your interest in participation are critical to solving some of the toughest and most important and interesting legal challenges facing our nation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Colonel Raul Rodriguez Medellin, Director of U.S. Cyber Command Office of Academic Engagements. In 2022, we launched the Command's Academic Engagement Strategy in order to deepen our partnerships with academia. Cyber Command established the Academic Engagement Network, also known as the AEN, which is a team effort across the DOD Cyber Mission Force and academia. Our Cyber Force members include the Command Headquarters, the Cyber National Mission Force, the Joint Forces Headquarters, DOTIN, and the Service Cyber Components. The response from our nation's educational institutions has been amazing. In the past two years, the AEN has grown to include 121 institutions from 37 states and the District of Columbia. AEN members include nine federal institutions, including Service War Colleges, the Naval Postgraduate School, and four of the service academies. Additionally, our 108 non-federal institution members include 15 institutions serving underrepresented communities. Cyber Command's academic engagement program has four strategic goals. First, engage the future workforce by inspiring a diverse group of students to pursue cyber education careers, both in the military and as civilians. Second, increase cyber applied research and innovation by encouraging research on our hardest problems. We are hosting another cyber recon effort this year, which involves student researchers mentored by Cyber Command staff. The Capstone Symposium will be held at the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland in mid-April of this year. Third, expand cyber-focused analytical partnerships by providing insight into adversary cyberspace strategies, organizations, and capabilities. Fourth, enrich strategic cyber dialogue by engaging faculty, we challenge Cyber Command's concepts and refine command strategies, as well as align our senior leader engagements with our academic partners. As we enhance our academic partnerships, the legal profession is a critical aspect to this maturing relationship that will allow us to increase intellectual rigor as we advance the nation's cyber warfare capabilities. To find out more, check out the AEN at cybercom.mil. Hi, I'm Colonel Pete Hayden and I'm excited to speak with you as a part of the U.S. Cyber Command Legal Conference. Whether you are in person or virtual, your interest and participation are critical to solving some of the toughest and most important and interesting legal challenges facing our nation. Our commander, General Hawk, has set out his guiding priorities based on our competitive strengths, people, innovation, and partnerships. This conference will give us the opportunity to discuss exciting legal issues involving all of these priorities. But I want to reach out on something near and dear to all of our hearts here at Cyber Command. Our commander's very first priority is people. At every level, we want to attract and develop talented practitioners in diverse disciplines to the cyber enterprise, including legal professionals. Through participation in this week's events, you'll see exactly why that's so important to Cyber Command, to the services, and to the nation. The bottom line is this, we need you. Here's why we hope that you'll want to join our team. The Cyber Command Enterprise is one of the very few places in which military attorneys routinely work side by side with partners from across the executive branch. They also get the rare opportunity to partner with the best and brightest throughout the joint force. To be a part of those high functioning joint teams comprised of talented attorneys from across the services. Our council worked closely with the legislative office to help shape our congressional authorities, whether drafting a legislative proposal, identifying policy and legal implications of an authorization act, 
or assisting with congressional testimony preparation. Our office is deeply engaged with our legislative liaisons and our legislative overseers. Our judge advocates, civilian attorneys, and paraprofessionals work closely with the private sector and academia to develop collaborative mechanisms to advance national security interests and defend against malicious cyber activity. Finally, U.S. Cyber Command attorneys regularly interface with our international partners on everything from military exchanges, exercises, information sharing, to coordinating plans and operations, furthering our interoperability and deepening relationships with our strategic partners. Here at United States Cyber Command, we build relationships across the services, industry, research community, academia, and the whole of government, and we do it to facilitate innovation and foster collaborative sharing platforms to advance our national security interests and defend against malicious cyber activity. Our partnership philosophy, it's baked into our statutory mission to direct, synchronize, and coordinate military cyberspace planning and operations to defend national interests in collaboration with domestic and international partners. Our practice is diverse. If you're a legal professional interested in national security law, we offer you opportunities you won't find anywhere else. Through your legal advice, Cyber Command will be better postured to defend Department of Defense information networks, to generate insights and options in defense of the nation and in support of other combatant commanders, and to ensure enduring mission advantage for the Department of Defense, the United States, and our allies and partners. If you're an administrative law or a criminal law practitioner, and you're listening in because you want to try something else, or you just find this work interesting. Your analytic and advocacy skills are what we're looking for to solve emerging problems and make lasting change. If you're a contract or fiscal law wizard, please give us a call. National security law and acquisition law work hand in hand to enable our operators to spur innovation and maintain our technological primacy and build our enduring advantage as the finest fighting force in the world. We're in a war for talent, and we look forward to partnering with you in the unique, demanding, and highly rewarding practice of law at U.S. Cyber Command. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the capstone presentation of day two of the U.S. Cyber Command Legal Conference. We originally advertised Mr. Matt Olson, the Assistant Attorney General for National Security at the U.S. Department of Justice, uh, but he was un unable to attend today. As you've heard a few times this week, uh, Section 702 reauthorization has required the time uh, and attention of several senior U.S. government leaders in the national security ecosystem. But in his stead, we are so fortunate to welcome Mr. Olson's principal deputy, Mr. David Newman. So for the format for the capstone presentation, Mr. Newman is going to come up and provide remarks. And then we are fortunate to have Mr. Raj Day, who will join him on stage seated for more of a fireside chat, and then we'll open it to questions. And this capstone presentation is entitled Disrupting Cyber Threats and Protecting U.S. Technology and Data. So I will quickly introduce Mr. Raj Day, and then I'll introduce Mr. David Newman, and he'll come to provide his remarks. So Mr. Raj Day is the managing partner of Mayor Brown's Washington, D.C. office. He leads the firm's global cybersecurity and data privacy practice, as well as the firm's national security practice. Mr. Day has held numerous senior appointments in the White House, the Department of Justice, the, the Department of Defense, and the National Security Agency. As Staff Secretary and Deputy Assistant to the President, he was responsible for managing all written material provided to the president. He was also the principal deputy assistant attorney general in the Office of Legal Policy at the DOJ. And close to all of our hearts at U.S. Cyber Command, Mr. Day was the general counsel of the National Security Agency. And finally, Mr. David Newman. Mr. Newman is the principal deputy assistant attorney general for national security at the National Security Division at the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, before returning to the DOJ, Mr. Newman was a partner at Morrison and Forster, and he previously served in government as the Associate White House Counsel and Special Assistant to the President of the Office of the White House Counsel, 
to the President and the Office of the White House Counsel and various posts on the staff of the National Security Council and as counsel to the Associate Attorney General for National Security at the DOJ. And he was previously a law clerk uh, to U.S. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Mr. David Newman. Th thank you so much for that uh, introduction, Josh. And I, I am keenly aware that uh, I am not Matt Olson and that I stand between this group and the end of today and drinks. So I will do my best to be uh, brief, if not interesting. Um, as Josh mentioned, my name is David Newman, and I serve as the Principal Deputy uh, Assistant Attorney General for National Security at the National Security Division, or NSD, as, as we are known, because we need to have an acronym to be in the national security space. It's very much an honor uh, to be here with such a distinguished crowd uh, so devoted to the mission. Um, before we begin the fireside chat portion, and, and Raj hits me with the hardball questions, I just wanted to spend a few minutes highlighting some of the ways in which we at the Department of Justice and NSD, my division in specific, is innovating to address the national security cyber threat landscape. Um, first, some very brief history. Congress created NSD in the aftermath of the September 11th terrorist attacks with a mission to unify DOJ's national security work. Um, the vision was to bring together the prosecutors and our counterterrorism and our counterespionage section, um, which were both in separate places in the criminal division, uh, under the same leadership that oversaw the DOJ lawyers who worked with the IC, obtaining uh, uh, surveillance authorizations from the FISC. Um, and the original mandate for NSD was to take down the unnecessary silos that separated law enforcement and intelligence professionals and folks such as yourself um, to ensure that DOJ could bring to bear the full range of authorities to disrupt national security threats. And for the first decade uh, of NSD's existence, our principal focus was on confronting the threat of international terrorism. And we knew we needed to change the DOJ mindset to become more threat and intel driven. And even as hundreds of terrorists, uh, hundreds of individuals were convicted of terrorists and terrorism related uh, charges in federal courts in the first decade after 9 11, um, we all knew and understood that the measure of success uh, was not a conviction, uh, but a stopped plot and the imperative to uh, detect and disrupt uh, terrorist attacks before they occurred. And today, in the National Security Division, there remains no greater priority for us than uh, the international terrorism mission as the horrific October 7th attacks uh, underscore. But, but as we all know, the national security threat landscape is a lot more uh, complex, dynamic, and varied. And our work has evolved to reflect, reflect that threat from capable nation state adversaries. The, uh, this is especially true when it comes to the cyber threat. We've all seen and, and heard, I'm sure, at this conference about the con concerning trend lines, hostile adversaries conducting cyber operations with alarming scale, speed, and sophistication. And cyber has become the vector of choice for hostile nation states seeking to steal our most sensitive technologies to exert foreign malign influence uh, and to project messages of repression at diaspora communities and compromise critical infrastructure. And the list of capable adversaries engaging at such activity is at this point by no means limited to the Chinas and the Russias. You see Iran and Iranian-backed proxies engaging in a broad array of sophisticated cyber activities, both to generate revenue and uh, to advance operations. You see the DPRK, the North Korean government, engaging in sophisticated crypto heists and IT worker schemes to uh, fund its nuclear program and authoritarian agenda. And you're seeing uh, increasing use of cryptocurrency and encryption from international terrorist groups to advance plots. And just as uh, the cyber threat has evolved, the National Security Division and the work of DOJ has needed to evolve to meet it. And we've tried to draw on some of our terrorism uh, roots to do so. Um, it may surprise some here to learn that up until last year, there was no one section at DOJ dedicated to going after national security cyber threats. Uh, instead, within NSD, um, that work was housed in CES, our counterintelligence and export control section, um, whose mission uh, also focuses on counterintelligence, sanctions and export enforcement, for, uh, countering formal line influence, uh, among other uh, mission requirements. 
and the number of national security prosecutors who specialized, specialized in cyber cases within the, NAS, within the Department of Justice was actually in the single digits. Um, so one of the key takeaways from a department-wide cyber review that was undertaken at the direction of Deputy Attorney General Monaco uh, in 2022 was that DOJ really needed to scale up substantially our, our footprint in this space. Um, and the theory was simple. Disrupting cyber-enabled threats requires enough prosecutors with dedicated time, strong partnerships, and increasingly specialized expertise. Uh, and we needed more prosecutorial horsepower to achieve the kinds of ambitious disruptive goals that were being set in the national cybersecurity strategy. Uh, that's why the department last summer established a new national security cyber section, or NATSEC cyber as we call it. And that new section, which is the first uh, enforcement section that was added in the history of the division, uh, put cyber on an equal footing with our counterterrorism and traditional counterespionage mission. Um, within DOJ, NATSEC cyber is intended to operate as a critical resource and force multiplier for prosecutors in the 93 U.S. Attorney's offices and the 56 FBI field offices throughout the country. Uh, prosecutors and agents in those offices are on the front line confronting the cyber threats in their district, um, but NATSEC Cyber enables us to partner with the field to respond swiftly to highly technical threats and to serve as an incubator for cases that are either too sprawling or too nascent for any one office to handle. Um, NATSEC Cyber is also a way to better align DOJ's own structure uh, so that it matches that of some of our key USG and international partners, many of whom have dedicated cyber units and workforces. Uh, but obviously, obviously, changes to the org chart are uh, the means and not the end. So I just want to give a few concrete examples of the type of work that we are accelerating. Uh, first, our focus is on disrupting illegal cyber activity before it can cause harm uh, and uh, threaten national security. Drawing from our CT playbook, uh, we are taking a threat-driven but also a victim-centered approach. And while we always look to make arrests where possible, um, our law enforcement disruptions can take many forms. And that's a matter of necessity because, as we know, many of our, our leading cyber subjects and targets, uh, particularly in the national security and ransomware space, are protected by hostile governments such as Russia and Iran. And in some cases, we know they're not just being protected, but they're receiving that protection in exchange for being on call for their local military or intelligence services. So how is law enforcement disrupting actors outside the context of criminal charges and arrests? Most prominently, um, we are emphasizing court-authorized technical operations so that at scale, we can curtail and at times even eradicate the infrastructure that these uh, hostile actors are using against us. Um, including infrastructure in the homeland that is outside the authorities of many other departments and agencies. Not long ago, those types of law enforcement uh, technical disruption operations occurred at most at a pace of about once a year. Um, but so far this year, uh, this year alone, the department has already announced three significant such operations, two of which were spearheaded by NSD alongside the U.S. Attorney's offices and FBI partners. Um, first, in January, we announced a court-authorized takedown of what was known as the KV botnet. That's a botnet of uh, hundreds of US-based small office, uh, home office routers, Soho routers, hijacked by the People's Republic of China, state-sponsored hackers known as Volt Typhoon. And the hackers used the botnet to conceal the PRC origin of further hacking activities directed against US and other foreign victims, including a campaign targeting critical infrastructure. Uh, organizations in the United States and elsewhere um, using one of our age-old investigative tools, uh, Rule 41, but in a novel way, the search and seizure warrant, um, we detected and deleted Volt Typhoon's malware and took steps to sever the routers from the botnet. Second, in February, we announced a court-authorized operation that neutralized another network of Soho routers that had been compromised, this time by the Russian GRU. And those routers were being used to launch cyber attacks against the United States and our allies, including in, in Ukraine. And again, using a Rule 41 search warrant uh, and a little bit of innovation, we were able to delete stolen and malicious data from the compromised routers and block the Russian actors from gaining further access to them. Uh, finally, also in February, uh, our colleagues in the criminal division, who are critical partners 
in this work spearheaded their own disruption against Lockbit, one of the most prolific ransomware groups menacing the private sector. Um, it, defer it deserves emphasizing that this is a team sport. Uh, even as the operations relied on DOJ legal process, um, we are very often not alone in planning or executing them, and we are almost always joined by a coalition of US government, private sector, and foreign partners in this work. Uh, in disrupting the GRU botnet, for example, we planned and coordinated with the Shadow Server Foundation, Microsoft, other private sector partners, and shortly after we announced the operation, the FBI, NSA, Cybercom, 11 foreign partners, uh, released a joint cybersecurity advisory providing device owners and network defenders with valuable threat intelligence uh, about the GRU's tactics, techniques, and procedures. Many of these same partners provided invaluable assistance in eradicating portions of the botnet within their, their borders. Um, and of course, technical disruptions represent just one aspect of our work. We also use the criminal justice system to identify and attribute malicious activity and to impose consequences on actors who may be specifically deterred even when foreign governments cannot be. Um, when DOJ returns public charges against a malicious cyber actor, we are telling the world that we stand ready to prove the allegations, in our case, beyond a reasonable doubt, with public evidence. And we intend for that to send a clear message about what conduct the US government believes is so out of bounds that it is deserving of criminal punishment, even when committed by overseas actors. So this public attribution uh, enables us to ask for and galvanize international support. And a good recent example is the indictment unsealed a few weeks ago in the Eastern District of New York. That indictment charged seven PRC nationals um, uh, who were members of a group called APT31 with engaging in a 14-year cyber campaign targeting US and foreign businesses, political officials, and dissidents and critics of the PRC. APT31's targets included individuals working at the White House, elsewhere across the executive branch, US senators and representatives of both parties. And the indictment noted that the actors in the APT31 group gathered information that could have been, even if it wasn't, uh, released in influence operations in connection with previous U.S. elections. Uh, the indictment, in turn, enabled the U.S. government to express common cause with 17 countries in Europe and Asia, who, on the same day the indictment was unsealed, made public statements condemning APT31's targeting of democratic institutions and political processes around the world. Um, so, in addition to the cyber actors themselves, it's important to note that DOJ is also redoubling our efforts to go after the source the cutting edge technology that enables these threats. Last year, the department stood up the Disruptive Technology Strike Force, an interagency enforcement team co-led by NSD, my division, and the Commerce Department's Bureau of Industry and Security. And the strike force was created to counter efforts by authoritarian governments to acquire sensitive technologies, including the technology that enables advanced computing and autonomous vehicle capabilities, such as semiconductors and microelectronics. And it brings together the collective power of law enforcement agencies to pursue enforcement actions against those who violate sanctions and export laws and trade secret laws to acquire sensitive technology. We've created 15 enforcement teams across the country made up of federal prosecutors and agents who are strategically co-located in places where there is a strong tech industry presence or heavy commercial trade, including in San Francisco, Phoenix, Miami, and Boston. And the collaboration is already generating tangible results. In less than one year, the strike force has announced 16 criminal prosecutions charging actors in the United States and abroad with procuring microelectronics on behalf of the Russian war effort, software engineers with stealing source code and other proprietary information to take to China, and buyers working on behalf of the Iranian regime with seeking to illicitly acquire UAV and ballistic missile technology. Strike Force's cases include protecting technology that can be used for cyber-related malign activity, including AI, which is a key focus area of this work. Last May, for example, we announced charges against a former employee at Apple who allegedly stole large quantities of data related to the company's self-driving car technology before decamping to a subsidiary of a Chinese company that was working to develop the very same tech. Just last month, we announced the arrest of a software engineer at Google who allegedly stole over 500 confidential files from the company. The stolen information included details about the hardware infrastructure and software platform used in Google's advanced supercomputing data centers. About the same time, 
that same defendant was allegedly stealing the information, he was secretly working with two China-based tech companies, including an AI-focused company that he founded. Um, we know that the cyber threats we face will increasingly be generated by AI technology, and that that technology will in turn be powered by bulk data sets involving Americans. Bulk data about an Ameri American finances, for example, can be mined for leverage, for coercion, blackmail, and espionage. And adversaries can use geolocation data and other information to identify US government personnel based on travel patterns and meeting activities. As a US government, we devote, everyone here devotes, extensive resources to preventing adversaries from obtaining sensitive data through illegal means, including cyber espionage and insider threats. Uh, but for too long, no federal law prohibited adversaries from simply buying this data uh, in bulk from data brokers and others who sell it on the internet, and that was perfectly legal. That began to change just uh, in February when uh, the president signed a groundbreaking executive order giving the Justice Department a uh, targeted new authority to prohibit or restrict uh, foreign adversaries from acquiring Americans' most sensitive data. Uh, this executive order protects seven categories of American sensitive data that pose the greatest risk, including genomic data, biometric data, such as fingerprints and key keyboard usage patterns, geolocation information, personal identifiers, personal health, and financial data. NSD has been delegated the primary responsibilities for implementing and enforcing <clears throat> this new program for the department. And we are upping our staffing and resources significantly so that we can carry out this responsibility as we move through the rulemaking process. So what I've just set out is, is a sampling of the work we're doing on the cyber front, which also includes, of course, our sanctions and our corporate enforcement work. And you can expect more of this type of innovation in the coming years. But uh, most of all, to end where I started, thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you for your understanding. And I look forward to the conversation. Okay, <clears throat> hopefully everyone can hear all right. That was great, David. And if you didn't know it before, I know we were supposed to be here with Matt, but David is really the brains behind the operation. And so uh, hopefully that, that did come across in his comments. So our plan is for me to ask a few questions of David um, on some of the topics that he spoke to, and then to open it up to the audience. So we're gonna have some time at the end. Now, before I start, uh, now that you know David is the brains behind the operation, one thing you may not know is that before I was the NSA GC, David's boss, Matt Olson, who is going to be here, was the general counsel, and we're very good friends. And I asked Matt, I was very nervous about taking that job, and I asked him, should I take this job over? And Matt, on his way out the door, said, yeah, you definitely should. What could possibly go wrong? And a few months later, Edward Snowden happened, and my life got turned upside down. So I had been planning to use this Q&A to needle Matt a little bit, but I'm going to take it easier on, on David in our questions. So, okay, you talked about the disruptive technology strike force. This is the joint strike force launched with the Commerce Department about a year ago, uh, and you mentioned some of the enforcement actions that have been brought. It sounds like many of them have been against individuals, um, but the DAG and the department, have, the Deputy Attorney General and the department have talked a lot about the importance of corporate compliance and corporate enforcement. What can you tell us about the department's plans towards more corporate directed enforcement, and just generally, where's the strike force going to go this next year? It's a fair question. Thank you for taking it, taking it easy on me. <laughs> um, so the department has made a huge investment in corporate, in corporate enforcement, especially in the national security space. Uh, this is something that our leadership has talked about extensively. In the national security division, which historically focused on uh, some of the kind of worst actors at the end of the spectrum, we have been developing a very sophisticated program that, that mirrors much of what the criminal division has historically done to take the measure of corporations' commitment to compliance with respect to national security laws. Uh, that included uh, hiring a, a dedicated chief counsel for corporate enforcement who works in our division, someone who had brought a groundbreaking case uh, a little over a year ago against a company called Lafarge that was the first ever guilty plea for material support for terrorism. 
uh, of any corporation. It was a multinational French company that had paid bribes to ISIS uh, during the time in which ISIS occupied much of Syria. Um, and it resulted in a 700 million plus uh, a penalty that, that was paid, as well as that first ever conviction. Um, we have also been partners with the criminal division on some other very major resolutions over the last uh, year. Um, not in the strike force context, so it's a fair question, but in other contexts. That included the resolution against uh, Binance, the, one of the largest cryptocurrency exchanges in the world that paid billions of dollars uh, in penalties and whose CEO came from uh, the UAE to the United States to plead guilty to a, a, a felony charge that potentially exposes him to a year or more of prison time and who has been um, required to stay in the United States pending his upcoming sentencing. Um, we also brought what is the largest uh, North Korean criminal sanctions enforcement case against British American tobacco um, uh, a little over a year ago. But you are absolutely right that I think the next level, the next measure of the strike force includes doing more to show that we are able to hold companies accountable. And again, the reason we do that is not because we are looking to, uh, you know, kind of check boxes of corporate enforcement. It's because ultimately in these spaces, companies are on the front lines. They have an obligation to protect their sensitive technology, their information, to report what they're seeing to the government. And we need to create the right incentives for companies that are doing the right thing to feel like they're uh, not being commercially disadvantaged and for companies who are not doing the right thing to reconsider their approach. And we have done a number of uh, things, including in terms of our voluntary disclosure policies, where we have tried to make more incentives for companies to come in early, but also, frankly, more um, uh, deterrence for companies that uh, choose to, at their own peril not to come in when they see challenges. So I, I don't want to get ahead of any of our enforcement work, but I think it's fair to say that we are very focused on uh, corporate enforcement, both in the strike force context and more generally um, as a way to reinforce some of the national security incentives that we want companies to um, be responsive to. Well, that's really great. As somebody who represents a lot of companies, it's really great to hear that it's not just about punishing bad actors, but about acknowledging, as many of my clients are, good actors who are trying to do the right thing. Um, so that, that's really great. So let me ask you, you mentioned the new NATSEC uh, cyber section. And you mentioned the, the indictments against the APT31 actors. So for lots of folks in the cyber arena, the threat landscape is just so overwhelming. So one natural question arises, do these individual indictments that the department bring, brings really make any difference? I mean, they're great symbolically, and they have some impact globally. But what is your best case to, de to defend why that tool fits into our overall toolkit for cyber activity? No, it's a, it's a, it's a very fair question. And I, I think we know that we're not going to be able to jail our way uh, out of the cyber threat arena. But we nonetheless believe very strongly that our cases can have impact. We just have to, we have to choose the right ones. So APT31, which I spoke about a little bit and, and you highlighted, is a, is a key example. First of all, separate apart from the individuals, I think the fact that we are able to tell in an unclassified form with a, a high degree of detail and specificity what it is that we had found is something that allows us to really galvanize, as I mentioned, international support, get other countries to sign on to what we're doing, sh show other countries that might have, frankly, less of an ability on their own to speak up and decry uh, Chinese malicious cyber activity that they have in the United States a kind of powerful voice that is uh, uh, verifying and corroborating what they are themselves seeing internally. Um, I also do think that uh, cyber actors, even if the countries can't de be deterred, even if we can't deter Russia or China from all manner of cyber activity, that the individuals who work in those countries, uh, who are part of some of these ecosystems of non-government actors who freelance on projects that they know are uh, kind of malign in nature, they don't they can be deterred and they, I think, feel the potential sting and, and punishment of even just being charged criminally in the United States and the restrictions that that comes in terms of their travel and their liberty. Um, so I think that's very important. And then lastly, we also are very focused on using those charges to uh, highlight what they're, to build kind of global consensus about what conduct is really wrongful and out of bounds, which I think is very, very important. And we give a lot of thought to that both at DOJ and in conjunction with our uh, interagency partners, so that the, con the conduct that we're charging speaks for a core set of uh, values and beliefs. 
Um, I will also just say, I think there are opportunities uh, as we progress to to get hands and cuffs on individual actors. You know, we have done so over the last several years. It's obviously the case that that several countries, Russia, I think first and foremost, has operated as like a safe haven for, for actors, but the Department of Justice has a long memory, and once individuals are charged, even if it's not right away, they may one day find themselves in a country that, unbeknownst to them, has a better extradition relationship with the United States than, than they understand. And so we are very much trying to use this tool to impose consequences. It's obviously just one tool in the toolkit, but it's something that we, that we believe strongly in. I'm glad you mentioned uh, norms, too, and the value, because I know a lot of people here, and particularly at DOD, think about cyber norms, and it's, it's good to know that it's a government-wide effort, so thank you for that. Um, let me turn to the data security EO, uh, which you referenced. So President Biden signed an EO a few months ago related to the transfer of U.S. government data or bulk U.S. person-sensitive data. Um, and there's a lot of details in there, but at a very high level, can you illuminate for all of us what was the real need for that EO? Are there any concrete examples of bad activities that this is intended to get at, or the new regulatory regime. And then, uh, like in a very simple way, I have lots of clients asking, why is justice uh, involved in a regulatory EO about personal data? And so a little bit of the backstory as to why is the Justice Department initiative? Sure, well, um, the, the answer to the first question is, I think it was there was a very um, conspicuous gap in the collective authorities and laws in the country. It, 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 frankly, myself and the different roles I play in the Justice Department, it was striking that we spent so much effort trying to uh, review, for example, under CFIUS, transactions involving data-rich companies to see what, what sensitive data could be uh, exposed to a foreign adversary. We spend so much effort working with the private sector on hardening their defenses against cyber threats that are being used to pull that data out illegally using uh, malicious cyber activities. We spend so much effort on working with the private sector on insider threat detection programs. And yet there was no kind of comprehensive law that prevented people from just selling that data directly from the United States to adversaries or more realistically to cutouts of those adversaries you know, on the open internet. And the market for data brokers is a very rich uh, market that, that is easily obtained. And e even if some sophisticated actors could use other means to get the data, I think the judgment that was made by many of them is that the easiest, lowest cost, lowest friction way to do it was actually just to buy it. Um, and that is, you know, at, at, at an unclassified level, I think part of the thesis of the case here. In terms of how that data can be used, and I, I, I previewed a little of this, but I think it's important to highlight it. If you have multiple large data sets of different kinds of sensitive information, financial data, geolocation data, health data, uh, other data, you can, that is a gold mine for any sophisticated adversary's ability to build models that can be used for all manner of nefarious purposes, starting most obviously with efforts to identify U.S. government personnel, to try to have insight into U.S. government actions, to try to start making uh, informed uh, assessments about plans, activities, operations of the U.S. government. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, frankly, we, it's probably the real question is why, you know, why haven't we done this sooner? Because it's such a significant threat. But at this point, we felt like we had to, we had to act and do it. And then in terms of your last question, which is, which is a fair one, um, first of all, DOJ, I think our sense was we have been at the forefront in the CFIUS process in some of our cyber-related work in looking at vectors of uh, vulnerability and attack into sensitive data sets. That's often where we are the lead in transactions under CFIUS. That's a role that we play. We also are a regulator in the national security space already in the role we play under the Foreign Agents Registration Act. So we already have a civil uh, regulatory function. And so although I would freely concede that there's probably no one department that is perfectly positioned to take on this role, we, uh, you know, with the encouragement of the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General, we were willing to take on this role because we just think it's a very important mission. Well, it's great that we've taken a step forward. I think, as most people know, the data broker discussion often gets twisted around privacy issues, which are valid, very valid, but has led to an inability to pass any legislation or anything like that. So, uh, at least if we can tackle it from a national security perspective, that's great. Um, okay, a couple more questions and then we're going to open it up. So think of your questions. So the theme of this conference is the power of partnerships. Um, and cyber is probably the quintessential example of a policy and, and threat topic that requires partnerships. Can you tell us a little bit about how the department is partnering with um, 
aff equivalents or affiliates outside the U.S.? And what does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? So it's a, it's, a, it's a great question. I think we, we have an extraordinary series of partnerships with other governments. I think it would, without getting into specific ones you know, in a, in a public setting, I think it would surprise many to know who are some of the countries that have some of the best um, accesses and capabilities in this space. And we have found often that our tools plus their tools adds up to much greater than what we could do individually. And, and, and we, we, the United States government, and through our law enforcement channels, can often obtain information or request information in a way that even other US government agencies that have very close relationships with, with those countries cannot. So for us, that is crucial. Um, again, I think the trend has been toward multi-jurisdictional, you know, multi-country uh, disruptions. That helps both to, to be more effective, since a lot of these uh, actions and actors are um, indifferent to national boundaries. And it also, I think, just highlights again that there is a growing consensus among a large body of countries that the cyber actions of a uh, small few nations is really out of control and violates uh, some of the basic kind of principles and norms of our, of our uh, 21st century society. So, you know, for us, that is, a, that is a key thing. It's one of the reasons why we needed to have greater dedicated uh, workforce in DOJ is to make sure that they're able to build and maintain those relationships uh, by being really focused on this work, and it's been a priority for, of ours. Uh. So it, it wouldn't be um, a conference with me not asking at the moment about the FAA uh, and Section 702. You've all read about this. This is a statutory authority that allows the government to collect um, intelligence about non-U.S. targets outside the U.S. with the help of U.S. companies. So I, and there's lots of hap things happening on the Hill, and you know, probably a minute-by-minute minute update isn't worthwhile, but um, at a very high level, I was at a, a talk with Director Ray yesterday, and he made an interesting comment. He's, and many years ago, I had worked on the 9-11 Commission, and so it resonated with me. He said, the idea that the U.S. government would need a warrant, which is one of the ideas on the table, to query information uh, that is already collected, to him, and he said this publicly, kind of is akin to the wall, which was one of the uh, identified issues before 9-11, which had to do with the sharing of intelligence information uh, in the US government. And he said the idea that we would have to get a court authorized warrant to actually search information that was lawfully collected reminded him of that sort of unnecessary uh, legal hurdle. So can you tell us at a very high level, like why is that such a pain? And do you think this is, from your perspective, what do you, how do you think this is likely to, to roll out? So uh, I'm, I'm not in the business of making predictions about, about Congress. I, I know it's something that is being discussed today, and that's one of the reasons that Matt Wilson can't be here with you. But what I, what I will say is for, for us at DOJ, it's, it's, it's not even just a pain. It is unworkable. And that, that is true because of the, the number of queries and the scale of what it would take as a program to have to go to the court each and every time. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court is a very thorough and rigorous process, but they are not equipped to review in the volume of US person queries that need to be run, many of them in the cyber area involving victims, many of them involving victims of other threat information. They are just not equipped to look at them in, in real time at scale. So that is one significant challenge. Another is they're just the standard of what you would apply to such a, um, uh, such a such a, a warrant would be very challenging to square with the reality of why we're running those queries. We're running those queries often early stages of an investigation in order to ascertain threats, plots, victims, targets. And at that stage, you are just not going to have the same type of information that you have when you're doing a traditional Title I or Title III FISA in the United States. And then most fundamentally, it is just a complete paradigm shift that's not required by US law. And that's because you are talking, if you're talking about querying that data, about information that was collected because of lawful targeting overseas of non-US persons and about information that's already been lawfully collected. And there is no comparable instance in which the US government has to get a warrant to uh, review information that has already been lawfully collected. Um, about targets overseas for a court-authorized, uh, statutorily enacted intelligence purpose. So it is a challenge of ours. Of course, of course, we always welcome the opportunity to find ways to enhance the oversight and rigor of the process. And I know that's something that's extensively been discussed, but, um, and that you and I have both, both worked on in much of our careers. 
but it's just not the case that that we could go to the court each and every time or that that would allow us to move at the speed of the threats that we're confronting. And just to put a fine point on the first point you made for everybody here, a lot of, not, I don't know the percentage, but a lot of the queries have to do with on U.S. persons is about searching for victims of cyber attacks so that we can know they were victims and alert them that they were victims. Okay, so let's, let's open it up to the crowd. You must have questions for David. Uh, so we'll see, uh, I'll look for some raised hands and then. Ra Raj is an expert too, so you should feel free to throw <laughs> his way if you want. I know this isn't a shy crowd. Nothing at the moment, I can keep going. Okay, why don't I, why don't I keep going and folks will think they'll have some, they'll, I think it'll percolate for a minute. So the topic du jour is AI. It's everywhere, it's in every conference, it's in, no matter what the topic. So one question for you is, how is the development of particularly generative AI just generally impacting the department? How, like how does it impact the threat landscape from your perspective? And then is it actually having any impact on the workforce? Are there things the Justice Department is doing with AI tools uh, to help with the legal tasks? So in the national security space, you know, we're focused both on um, how adversaries are using AI and also potentially how, how we can use AI. So sticking to the first of those in terms of the adversaries, I think we are very focused, for example, in the foreign malign influence space on what AI will mean for the ability of governments, including governments that don't have the resources to have a lot of native English speakers and others who can um, produce credible seeming uh, English speakers, uh, what it can mean for them in that space, what it can mean for their ability to create you know, fake personas, fake uh, authentic seeming video and other media, what it could mean for influence operations. So that is, I think, a huge concern. And the, the growth curve of that threat is just very difficult to get our, our arms around in, in terms of, of course, malicious code and the ability to use AI to generate kind of malicious code. That is another area that I think is of great concern, just given, given as, as probably folks here know better than I do, what that could mean to the kind of lowering the costs and barriers to creating all manner of malicious cyber tools. There is obviously, as I, as I talked about with the data security, oh, a great deal of concern around what AI could mean for uh, other uh, adversaries' ability to use large data sets for surveillance purposes and to detect and expose uh, uh, and respond to US government operations and activities. So you know, to me, those are top of the list. There's obviously also a, a very vibrant conversation about what the government can do to actually use AI that is something that will keep lawyers in business for a very long time. And it's a little less the province of our division, but it's a very important, it's a very important subject because it's obviously something that is uh, changing the entire landscape. One question for you at a very high level. When I was at NSA, we interacted with the Justice Department quite a bit, both in terms of enabling some of the operations we wanted to conduct, depending on the, the landscape, but also in an oversight capacity. And folks here who are at DOD or maybe in the intelligence community have that same dynamic with justice. It's a little bit of support. On the flip side is, I think the average operator is a little scared of interacting with DOJ lawyers because you don't know where that's gonna go and are, are you really the friend or are you really the overseer? So can you speak to that at a very high level, that dynamic and how do you encourage trust with folks at DOD, folks at NSA uh, to ensure the cooperation you want while at the same time you're kind of doing compliance reviews and making sure we're all staying within the bounds of the law. It's a great question and obviously a fair question. I mean, first and foremost, I do think we regard our mission as to enable enable operations to go forward, enable the operators to do our work. Uh, you know, in the National Security Division, people went into that field because they care deeply about the mission and they have just tremendous uh, respect uh, and appreciation for the work that everyone is doing. And I think that mindset has to be um, the kind of paramount uh, dynamic across all the interactions. Um, in terms of some of the challenges, I, I know that DOJ, DOJ sometimes does play an oversight role, sometimes is seen that way. You know, I, I, I think for whatever we add in terms of uh, having to kind of put extra lawyers' eyes on things, we also do bring, as I tried to indicate, a number of authorities into the toolkit. I think increasingly, when, it, when you're talking about domestic infrastructure, operations that cross borders, things that we can do, with our criminal toolkit that you know maybe others can do too, but we can do it and then talk about it and then use it in a different way. There's a lot that we can bring to the table, but for us to be 
to be able to use those, we have to know about what's going on. We have to have the opportunity to be able to contribute. So I think we are still, in some ways, the the newer kid on the block in those discussions. We don't have the same, the certainly the same size and scale as some of the other departments. But we are trying to show that we uh, can add value. And and some of the things that I talked about in my my opening are ways that we're trying to position our workforce to gain those relationships and gain that trust, so we can we can contribute. I think we have one question over here. <coughs> Good afternoon, gentlemen. We've made it two days into this conference now, and no one has said this yet. TikTok. <laughs> Do you, obviously, there's pending legislation. Do you believe that is a singular one off case, or do you believe that's going to open the door to a game of whack a mole? So, is your question about the legislation or about the threat, the legislation? A little bit of both, right? Uh, I, I believe the threat exists. Is legislation the right way, or is there maybe another path to address that threat? It's, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, I think at, at a top line, the Department of Justice, others have supported legislation precisely because there is a current gap in our authority that makes it difficult to address the issue of foreign adversary controlled. Uh, social media applications. Essentially, the problem that a lot of those applications both collect a very rich amount of data that ultimately can become available to foreign adversaries, you know, including China, and also that um, those tools can also potentially be a vector for the transmission of either malicious code or other manner of um, uh, malicious activity on behalf of a foreign adversary. So I think that is a very real concern, even without regard to a specific company. And the legislation that advanced in the House, although it, it has specific reference to TikTok and ByteDance, it actually gives authority across a, a kind of targeted category of foreign adversary controlled social media applications for us to do things. Um, in terms of the whack-a-mole or tit for tat, I mean, it, it absolutely is the case that, of course, there, there is that aspect with all adversaries. They're going to find new entry points and new vectors. But this does seem like a significant gap in our current authorities. It's also the case that there really is no symmetry if you're talking about China between us and China in that space. China does not even allow TikTok itself to operate in China. China does not allow U.S. companies uh, to operate in any respect in the way in the way that we allow all manner of companies to operate here. Uh, it's not intended to be uh, that bill is not intended to ban those 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 applications. Uh, it's intended to change their ownership, and it is not intended to change. Uh, the, the the ability of users to use the to post content on the platform. So I think it is they're very different from the way, for example, China and other adversaries regulate their systems. It's not about ideas. It's not about speech. It's about responsible ownership. And uh, the only thing I would say, you know, in conclusion, is if if tomorrow someone tried to buy a social media application who is based and controlled, based in China and subject to the control of the Chinese government or the Russian government or the Iranian government. Uh, our CFIUS process would never allow that to happen. We would never allow uh, a company that was subject to instructions by those governments to do that. So I think from our perspective, it's a little bit of a, uh, it's a significant and notable gap that where something can grow kind of organically across borders and have that um, aspect, it is otherwise, it's suddenly beyond the purview of the US government. Thank you. I think I had one more question here, or maybe if you both don't mind saying your question out loud and, and uh, David can address them together. So, ladies first. Sure. Hi, I'm Amy Neiman, and I'm the Army War College Fellow at DOJ. So, uh, just wondering, in the wake of Colonial Pipeline and uh, some high-profile indictments of Russian hacking groups, there's been increased interest in what exactly the DOJ components are up to. So, can you share some thoughts on the department's thoughts, maybe on uh, disruption versus pros prosecution? And to the gentleman, maybe we could ask your question. You can wrap them both up. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, my question, as you were giving your, your, I don't want to say speech, but as you were giving your presentation, one of the words that came to my mind is extraterritoriality. Uh, a couple of times it just kept popping up. Since the, the theme of the, uh, of the conference is partnerships, uh, are you able to talk to how you, uh, DOJ engages partners to overcome the perception that we are applying our laws extraterritorially? I mispronounced that, but you know what I meant. Is there both, both really good and fair questions. So, I mean, on, on threats involving Russia specifically, I think the department has been very focused for many years, but especially since February of 2022, 20, uh, in how we have to position ourselves. We have a whole uh, task force, Klepto Capture, that focuses on the seizing of, 
uh, Russian oligarch and and Russian state Russian state actors and their wealth uh, by enforcing our sanctions laws. We have done uh, significant innovative things in the war crime space uh, in regards to some of the atrocities being committed by Russia in Ukraine. We have uh, worked extensively, including using the strike force, to try to see what we can do to break the uh, uh, supply chains that are allowing components that the Russians are using and some of their most uh, effective weaponry from being uh, restocked by using you know, cutouts and others that, that flow through different parts of um, uh, Eastern Europe and Asia. And that, has, that is a huge priority of the department, and, and there are, uh, there's a lot of resource being put into that space um, because we want to do what we can to contribute. Um, in terms of the extraterritoriality, extraterritoriality question, I think it's a great question. Uh, obviously, within DOJ, I think a lot of our focus is on cyber activity that's outside the United States that aims itself inside the United States. And uh, you know, I, I feel like we are on pretty safe ground from our domestic laws and international laws from treating that activity rightly as activity that we at least have it crosses threshold to the point where we have a legitimate interest in deciding if it, if it comports with our laws and with international uh, norms. Um, but, but I think the, the point you make is an important one, which is um, it, it is important for us and we do our best at the Justice Department to try to ask ourselves with every case that we bring in this area, what is the principle for which this case stands? What is the rule that we feel like we ourselves as US government want to be able to champion and what are we what are we exactly are we calling out as wrongful because i think where those cases are most impactful is when you have that principle where we can get other countries uh, of like-minded values to line up in favor of those principles and where we can articulate a broader theory of the case i think where we risk um, uh, some of the kind of escalations and confusion that can happen is if we don't have that consistent theory of the case of what what kind of behavior we're trying to uh, uh, render off limits and what kind of behavior we're willing to tolerate. Thank you for that. And everybody, I hope you'll join me in thanking David Newman. And Raj. Ladies and gentlemen, now you understand that why we as U.S. lawyers practicing at Cyber Command and in the department and, you know, in the State Department and Homeland Security, why we also value our partners at the Department of Justice. Uh, just marvelous attorneys, marvelous partners, marvelous colleagues. And I think that demonstrates what Mr. Newman had to say, just how effective partnership can be. Partnership in the interagency, partnership in the private sector, partnership with our international partners and what they are able to talk about that they're able to accomplish. <clears throat> One of the best lines I heard today, um, it, it, it had nothing to do with hellacious, it had nothing to do with cadences or vitamin I or even federal acquisition regulations. One of the best lines I heard today was two panelists uh, after the end of the, their panel, they said, why haven't I met you before? And I think that is hopefully what we've allowed that question, or at least the spirit of that question, to be evident here after the second day. We heard from Director Coker, who talked about partnerships and how it enables us to promote, implement, reinforce norms of acceptable behavior in cyberspace, and how important everything that we do is to reinforcing those norms that the U.S. wants to promote internationally, in particular with regard to protecting our critical infrastructure. We heard about how its uh, partnership is critical to the responsible use of artificial intelligence transformative, challenging lawyers, and not to perpetuate, in the words of General Gruen, the vitamin I deficiency, that as lawyers we have to allow imagination, innovation to occur. Critical infrastructure protection, we learn that partnership isn't just nice to have, it's critical. We have to do it in order to protect critical infrastructure, and that is one of our most important missions, to defend the nation in cyberspace. In fact, and it wasn't just you know, th this isn't just coming from the Cybercom OSJ. It's not just coming from other lawyers. General Maylock sat right there and said why lawyers are important. And it's because lawyers are integral to operationalizing partnerships. Leaders come up with great ideas on how we can work together. 
Lawyers then have to get together and figure out how to make it work, how to make our laws, our authorities, our capabilities, our resources, and our limitations and liabilities all work together for everyone's benefit. And then we got to hear from the regulatory panel. And this is the point at which it started to occur to us that partnerships are hard, right? As we're implementing more and more regulations, reporting regulations, cybersecurity regulations, data sharing regulations, they're different internationally than they are in California, than they are in Connecticut, than wherever. We have to harmonize the regulations. And so the lawyer's job in implementing partnerships is hard. We get that. Our international partners talked about how they want to work with us and they want to work with each other and how we can work with them. But what we need to do, and the takeaway that I got from that was to be curious about one another's laws, limitations, partnerships, capabilities. And so that's what we're here for. We're here to be curious. So what do I take away, especially after hearing that remarkable capstone presentation from the Department of Justice, where Mr. Newman talked about three successful operations just this year that involved partnerships in the face of all of those challenges that we talked about this afternoon. Implementing partnerships is hard work. But we learned this morning that it's imperative that we do it. And we as lawyers have to implement our partnerships to make it work. And the Justice Department told us not only, not only can it be done, but it can be done with great effect. And it's very successful. But more to the point, it's immensely rewarding, right? To build and maintain trust over time with those people we would partner with and to do it over and over and over so that we don't have to say to the people that we really value, why have we met you before? So I encourage you, for the remaining time that you have here, if you're coming to the social tonight, if you're around later in the week, meet people so that you don't have to ask that question next week, why haven't I met you before? Make your partnerships in this room and keep them enduring. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Lieutenant Colonel Lincoln, who is going to thank the outstanding defense media activity team that has made this possible and the Smart Center, and everybody else, and then tell us where we can all go socialize later. Thank you, sir. So this concludes our two days of unclassified sessions and the end of our live streaming. And we couldn't have made it possible without the wonderful production of our friends at the Defense Media Activity. So let's give them a wonderful round of applause. And as a reminder, these sessions will be recorded and available on Divids. So you, if you missed a session for our live streaming audience or anyone here, you can access that online for a uh, long time from now. So please, please uh, check that out. Also, thank you to all, all of our international participants and, of course, the Smart Center for hosting us here. Just a couple uh, clear, um, uh, administrative remarks. So as Colonel Hayden mentioned, please join us immediately following the conclusion of this.